<sighs> Hello, everyone. Let's see if this works. Let's see if this is going to work. Let's see. How are we all doing today? Are we all enjoying ourselves? Hello, John Shea. Hello, Peter Dawson. Hello, Calvin Gausberg. Hello, Bijan. Hello, Zaski. Hello, Furry Kitten. Hello, Sean B. Ooh. You know what? I think we're still stuck. I think we're still stuck back in the Civil War period. <sighs> Give me a second. Let's see what happens if this, if Battlestar Galactica goes down. Let me go back. Oh, that's the trouble if you do it, Battlestar Galactica, isn't it? That just goes really, really weird. Okay, uh, let's try a different one. Let's try tankers. So, crude oil tankers. Kiyama. Let's see. It's a nice, non normal thing. And there you go. Back to normal. Hello, everyone. How are we all doing? <laughs> Oh. <laughs> right then. Hello, Bozaski. Hello, uh, Frank Spado. Hello, Second Zero. Furry Kitten. Hello. It be Sunday. You'll be nearly <laughs> gazing today. <laughs> You're nearly drunk. Mm -hmm. I guess that one somehow. Hello, Jonathan Burrow. Hello, Shimi. Hello, Derp Squad. Ooh, Sepia. Yeah. Hello, Tisrantis Fault. Hello, D Bijan, DG40, M35 Benvids. Uh, ben M35 Benvids. Hello, Hieroglyphed. <laughs> Don't say I thought it was a graphical glitch. <laughs> no, I haven't flipped. I just thought I'd do a bit of a trick because I did. If you've noticed, if you've done, uh, seen the uh, Sherman's March to the Sea, you will realize that I did that all in sepia. And the reason I did that in sepia was I wanted to do that oldie worldie style, and I thought it'd be quite good for the uh, you, uh, the um, American Civil War. So I did that in sepia. Now I'm doing this. Hello, oh, Stafford Thompson. Did you haven't seen your question on Twitter, uh, Twitter about RTGs? No, I haven't yet seen your question on Twitter, and I'm sorry I haven't seen it. Um, I will say that I have seen... Ooh, it's mirrored. Mm, let's see. I'm not supposed to be mirrored. This is my left hand. And it's coming up on the right of your screen. Hmm. I should probably mirror it. I should probably, he says. Hmm. But it reads right this way, so I'm going to leave it the way it is. Hello. You tagged me ass and me and Drac with Bill Trump's. Well, Stafford, I will look into it. I have to say, one of the reasons I haven't been checking Twitter as much today is because I've been prepping for this. But also, I have been wandering around doing or dealing with joyous things of neighbours. And getting a huge pile of books together. Two things to note. One. One. Down below you will find a link to December's patron suggestion. Someone has already suggested. And I do not believe this. Someone has already suggested Vader and Fraun on the side of the Japanese Empire in World War II. Um, you see, the thing is, uh, Fraun you could do, and Tarkin you could do, but Vader, you see a lot of his tinkering. He tinkers with a lot of machinery, but he doesn't really build big projects. At least there aren't any Star Wars books which have him going into detail building really big projects, or a whole fleet of ships. He leaves that more to the fleet to work on. He tinkers with things. And he customises things. 
It all depend on, I suppose, on what roles they were defined as, on who they replaced. But there again, Tarkin, I, uh, Thrawn, I could never, um, and never accept the Japanese making the same mistake if they were being advised by Thrawn as they did. Well, they, they had plenty of people who were advising them who were very sensible. So maybe they would have. But it's a question. Hello, George Newman. How? Okay. Ooh. Night, uh, night six, everyone. Uh, I'm not getting into that one. Mainly because. I, how do I put this? I, I, I did my bachelor's at St. Mary's. It was a lovely university. But it was a Catholic university. And so I have a whole host as the Protestant boy who went to a Catholic university and occasionally uh, um, played chess with the priest on a couple of occasions, etc. Those sort of things. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I can make some jokes based around a group of three people and you declaring one as God. Well, there's, there's two other roles <laughs> that I could go for and I'm not going to because that's blasphemous. That, that would probably get me to Catholic Church coming down on me hard. I'm watching on this on my new tablet. This could go either way. It could do. Max Father, let's see. You're now at seven thousand. Yes, I am. Woohoo! The trouble is, I've got the bet to get to thirteen thousand, and well, that's supposed to be by December. So I'm very happy. Thank you very much, everyone who's got me over seven thousand. I am working out what the appropriate thing will be when we reach eight thousand, because I did do something when we did four thousand. Um, I'm not sure what it is, but. Mm. So, okay, Vader for the ja with the Japanese army, Tarkin for the navy. Hmm. Not really sure about that one. Avia Enterprise, thank you. Hello. It's interesting enough, maybe if we didn't use Vader, maybe if we used Anakin. Because Anakin has a more interesting history in some respects. Ship designs. There again, if Anakin had been in his right mind and had full power, full call his authority uh, of his um, faculties and been as influenced as he's supposed to be, then I can't see them getting rid of the Venator class. But no, that's an entirely different discussion. Um, Frank Swallow, Doug C, what kind of music would 18th century sailors listen to if they had boomboxes on board? Well, if they had boomboxes on board, for starters, they'd probably be very, very happy, but, um, what they tended to listen to when they were actually themselves was they'd have violin music, and they'd have fiddles, and occasionally someone have some, some sort of drums, and some smaller musical instruments, and there's, there's always a fair, a few number of things going around, but Probably it'd be dance music of a kind. Uh, think things like the floral dance and things, music, and bits of music like that. Hello, Trent Lanka. Hello, Cameron. Karen. Eight K about eight K ship classes consisting of eight ships potentially. Hello, Bright today. Hello, Friars Ag. Wouldn't Tarkin just want to build super battleships? Well, we went over this with the Tarkin in the World War One scenario, and I, I, yes and no, because yes, he'd build powerful battleships. He would certainly build powerful battleships, but I, it would affect a lot more things than just the battleships what would be constructed. Mm. Nice again. Probably not, because the main thing that gets the workers from my and out of service is the jet engine and the transition to an all jet carrier force. Jonathan Burrow, random question, favorite meal? Beef Wellington. With Some form of cheesy potatoes, probably. Is 
So I don't care. What if Abba Command had war spike levels of plot armor? Oof, they win everything. But that's if they have war spike levels of plot armor. DH89, any sort of re uh, any suggestions on recent war games on potential and warfare naval warfare against China? Has there been modern naval war battle if a, if trick to conceptualize what modern naval battles look like? Not really. Uh, the Sauron, like one, if Vader became the Emperor, how would he uh, oversee from an exec position? How would he direct naval policy to Empire? Ooh, that would be different. If he'd been if Vader, if Vader as Emperor, would have been an interesting one. Would have been an interesting one. But as said, uh, thank you, James, for your comment already on Patreon. Uh, literally, I, I had I had put that up, I think, about five seconds, and James has commented with a suggestion of a topic. So thank you, James, for that one. Um, all right, I'm just going to type in the times. Because it's always good to have some timings. And I knew I was going to do this earlier, and I forgot to do it. I've really should have this set up so I can just do it. But I keep forgetting to. So, hope you're all okay, hope you're all having a fun time, and hope you're looking forward to today, because, as I said, I have got, I think it's 16 books, or 15 books. Roughly one or the other, depending. I think it depends on whether you, how you count things, which is probably going to sound strange. But wait until you see. And I set up the timings because I think this is roughly going to be four hours, roughly to get through them all. Well, hey, all done. So, now I don't have to worry about anything other than chatting with all you good people and answering your questions for the rest of the session, hopefully. Yay. Uh, right. Assuming Richard, hi, Doc. Sorry, I'm late. Dogs come always first. They do always come first. They should do. Trust me, the, the fluffy research assistants get a walk before this. If ever I'm late, the reason is because I'm walking the dog. So I have to admit, mine have given me this, so... You know. Best dog dad. Apparently is me. Mm. <sighs> right. So, today's first book. As we've already started talking sci-fi and Star Wars, I'm going to start off with the sci-fi, but a Star Wars book. This is Star Wars to Complete Vehicles, and it's honestly one of the best sci-fi books there is. It is the benchmark I use to rate other books which, exa which examine ships. It has very good graphics. It has nice descriptors. And honestly, when I start doing things like Looking at when I was doing the Thrawn and Tarkin thing in World War One, 
and considering about what changes they would make to their navies, the first question I asked was, what decisions did they make about the navies they were in charge of? Seemed a very sensible place to start. And that meant I was looking at things like this and going through it. Looking at their ship design, their blaster stations. And of course, the Imperial Star Destroyer. So this is a really, really good book. And you can find a link down below. If you've got anyone in your family who is interested in Star Wars and doesn't have this book, they are going to love it for Christmas Day. It'll keep them busy for hours. And it's just a good read. I will say this. The more I read books like this, the more and more I am convinced that the Empire, and especially its leadership, had absolutely no strategic sense whatsoever. ever. Because this is a freaking good ship. Okay, maybe you want to build your Imperial Star Destroyer sl bigger and slightly different. But this is a good idea. Having fighter base is a good idea. It saves on ships and allows you to multiply power. Imagine if you designed this to one of the, to the scale of the Imperial Star Destroyer with a huge central hangar like, like this has and good fighters, but with all the firepower properly distributed and properly organized. Okay? doesn't take much effort to have a centerline battery that can shift either way. It doesn't take much effort to put in decent uh, to put the guns in decent positions. Instead, they design ships which have so many flaws. And I, I, I do understand that part of the law is that, frankly, the gal galaxy has reached the malaise and is no longer really able to function. But it's... <sighs> if I put this in terms... This is, to me, is like if I've built a town class cruiser and then I built the county class. If I'd done them that way round. Because I've gone from a really versatile, really flexible ship to a ship which has more punch, yes, but has lost a lot of its flexibility. It's very useful. In a certain circumstance, it has advantages over this one. But there's a reason the town class comes after the counties. It's a very cool book. Uh, Colin Cameron, do you have the Haynes uh, YT book? I probably do, but it's not in the list with the set of books I've got out for today because I. My plan is to, at some point, do a whole brew ships, which is about Freeman books, and do another whole brew ships, which is about Haynes books. But no, it is a very good book, and it has basically all the tech from all the films in us involved. So it's a one-stop shop for you to go and have a look around. And honestly, I just enjoy it. It's a good book. Night six eight three one. How much trouble the USN if IGN Shinano was finished sooner and the design floor of the joint between the waterline arm belt and the torpedo bulge was fixed and her doors were seaworthy? Well, it depends how much, how soon she's finished. If she's finished in time when they still have enough um, pilots going around that they can produce a decent air group, then great. If they finish at a time when she's still not going to have an air group or not going to have an air group which is, has some decent pilots in it, then it's not really much help. That's the problem for Shinano more than anything. It, honestly, if you're going to fix anything about the Japanese, it's not so much the generation of aircraft carriers, it's the generation of pilots and aircrew 
and they need to come up with a system which has trickle matter, which has what I would call trickle crewing, whereby experienced pilots are rotate, experienced pilots in their group are rotated back to train new ones. So you raise the standard of new uh, new ones coming in, and you always have new ones coming in, replacing the old ones going back, so that the squadrons are always a mixture of veterans and newbies, and people in between. So that you, if you lose a whole squadron, you've never lost all your veterans, but you're also in a scenario where you've always got a new, you've always got a flow of experience of, let's say not experience, but informed pilots coming in to replace them. And that's the big problem for them. That is the really, really massive problem. Ooh. And that's what you need to fix for the Japanese. You need to fix their pilot training. Well, that'll be the... <sighs> there are three things you would need to fix about Japan to give them... Not a chance of winning the war, but a chance of maybe going on long enough to get the Americans to do a negotiated peace. And it basically comes down to anti-submarine warfare capability, a lot more submarines to try and do a defense in depth using submarines, and keeping the rest of the fleet broadly speaking the same, but having having a far larger pool of naval aviation and naval pilots and actually getting some uh, getting the aircraft carriers into service will be always great but you're more likely to have your aircraft carriers in service and in service for longer if you have that but also you need to have fuel supplies to make all that work and that's um, the uh, the big change you'd have to make behind all that is you'd have to do the infrastructure supporter which would have to include synthetic oil production of some kind Hang on, let's see. Do you know anyone who worked with the Nimrod? Yes. Fair number. I quite like them. Seneca, the Star Wars universe doesn't even have conning towers. The Star Wars universe is just weird in some respects. Um, no, secret. I had a chem I had heard Chemist Prince Yugen had her oil tank strained because they were about to rupture. Just how dangerous are the leftover World War II wrecks to us today? Uh, a, a huge danger. We did an entire build trumps on this. They are fun times. Curry, furiary, kitten. You've adulterated your iron brew with ethanol. Oh. I'm getting to the level of torpedo juice. Uh, Seneca, the training system is the same as the clone training in the latter seasons of Clone Wars. Mm. General Murray, Queen Elizabeth class with Nagato 16 inches. Good, bad. It's not much of an improvement over 15 inch. Honestly, I'd prefer to have an upgraded up gun, a 15 inch gun, because that would be easier to fit in. But if you could, if you design them from the beginning with 16 inches, then they'd be, uh, that'd be fine. And again, this is one of those things to go back in history. One of those starting points, the interesting starting point in history. Is the Battle of Tsushima speeding up the construction of Dreadnought and everyone else, and everyone else speeding up the construction of their Dreadnought-style ships? Because that is what I would argue pushes the decision to, instead of going for the EOC 14-inch, to go for the 12 inches which are available, because it's quicker and it gets to build a construction book quicker, which is what starts off the battleships on the 12-inch. Because once you've kept that going, you don't make a jump to the 14-inch until the bigger gun until you have to. Whereas if the Dreadnought had included a jump away from the 12-inch to the 14-inch, then you would have got a very different naval race. And honestly, that's what the other things... It, the point I made when I was talking about the Dreadnought class, 
the nature of the dreadnought was, and to be said, Dracus made this quite well. Uh, Dr uh, Dracus made this as well, which is quite nice because it means that both us, someone who I respect a lot, has made the same come to the similar conclusion as me, and that HMS dreadnought is great. But the British needed to keep building them. They didn't need. They should just paused, and they do sort of pause, and that's what allows the Jones to catch up. But the thing is, also, she's not a big enough jump. If she had been fourteen-inch guns, then the Germans would have been sat there going, "Well, there's no." Let's put it this way: if Drenor is launched and she's got 10 14 fourteen-inch guns, then everyone's going to look at it and go, "Do my eleven-inch guns match up?" No. Do my 12 inch guns match up? No. Okay. So then you're going to have to start developing bigger guns as well. And it, it causes a whole different race. But it also, if we consider the time it takes for people to develop guns in, and grow guns, it could have actually pushed the Germans, probably not the Americans, because they're already to extent working on a 14 inch. It could have pushed them back. It could have pushed them back months, if not years, in being able to enter the race, which could have allowed the British to take that time to then build up. Plus, you'd have ended up with Invincible class having 14-inch guns, which would have been quite cool, because that might have improved their armor scheme as well. They'd probably have to go with center line as well for them. Uh, so they've probably gone two center forward and two center aft, rather than having that wing turret arrangement, uh, the sort of weird... Mm, weird wing arrangement and you'd have probably ended up with well the interesting thing would have been the super dreadnoughts when they went to 13 and a half they wouldn't have gone to 13 or 14 to 13 and a half and they wouldn't have gone to 15 from 14 so they'd probably end up going to 16 which then gives you a whole different thing of what are the queen lizard class going to be it gets interesting In winter, how many IJN pilots would have survived if they just fitted self-sealing fuel tanks to their planes? A lot more. But then they'd have had to develop them and put them into certain mass production. And remember, these things are these things take time and development money. Fred Blogs, the US had cracked their codes. Everything else was inevitable. Eh, uh, yes and no. The Japanese had cracked some codes as well. And honestly, it is inevitable because of the size of the Americans. But you have to remember how war-weary the Americans were getting by the end. If you can make it go on longer, if you can make it a lot harder, you might not win. I'm not saying that Japan wins. I'm just saying they might not have lost so badly. The Kantai Kesson strategy aimed their subs as anti ceremony combat platforms. If existing subs had been given the role of shooting up enemy fleet tankers, that would have been big. It would have been. But uh, I have already been into the Kantai Kesson quite heavily on a couple of occasions. Uh, Battle of the Philippine Sea and the Cruiser Doctrine. I have a feeling I'm going to probably get at some point asked to do another video about the Kantai Kesson, probably focused on their submarines or their aircraft carriers. I, I, I just have that feeling from some of the questions I've, and chats I've had with people on Discord. And it would make sense. Freaking Operation Chase brings to mind. Hmm. Yeah. Congress, re Emperor and KV being stupid. Nope. That they are driven by the dark side. Uh honestly the dark side seems stupid then. Nice clear on. Is the Blackburn Rock a symptom of problem in the Royal Navy leading up to World War Two? Uh, the Blackburn Roth is a symptom of the Air Ministry's belief that turret fighters were the next big thing, and the Royal Navy going, do we have to? Yes. Okay. You sure this is the right idea? Yes. Well, we don't want to pay money to develop a specialised aircraft for it, or airframe for it. Okay. So we're fitted on the skewer. Oh, lovely. Honestly, I think the Royal Navy was kind of hoping to cancel it and get more skewers, which would have been more use. And let's be honest, if the skewer had been given the engine, the Royal Navy uh, had hope for it, and the Air Ministry had sort of talked about them getting, but then they went with the lower rated engine, the skewer could have been better. Because the skewer with a 
thousand horsepower engine is probably a far better aircraft than it was with the engine it had. I sometimes see you making a long patrol and some months later Drac makes a rum rash on the same topic. I think books exchange hands. Books, conversations, a lot of chatting. And some night six A run, sixteen and a half inch. A sixteen and a half inch is a weird caliber. I don't think they would have gone to that. As I said, if they start at fourteen, uh they could go to fifteen and a half and then up to uh, 17, or for the Queen Elizabeths, or alternatively, and this is what I see more likely happening, they end up going to 16 for the, Ori uh, the Orions, and then possibly 18 for the Queen Elizabeths. Right, they, all, as a submarine builder, all I hear are big targets. All anyone hears is big targets. Hello, Melody 640. So, next book. The Development of Crude Oil Tankers by Dr. Ray Solly. Now, there are going to be a fair number here going, Alex, this is a Naval History Channel. Why are you doing this book? Because it's great. It got was sent to me by pen and sword as a bit of a, well, we're not sure if you might like this, you might not like it. And it's really, really good. It's got plans. It's got history in it. And if you want to understand why merchant ships have gone the way they have, this is a great place to start. It's got some brilliant cross uh, cross framing in it. It's got some beautiful pictures and text. It's got a full discussions on some of the really huge beasts, which are now there. This is Solly has done an absolutely amazing job with this. And it's one of the interesting things is when you start off and you go, right then. 1861 is the sailing brig Elizabeth Watts transports the world's first cargo of crude oil. 1861. In 1886, Glavshoff launches a prototype of today's tanker at 2,297 gross registered tons. Vacuum becomes the first British purpose built and owned tanker classified by Lloyds of London as a hundred A one for carrying bulk or bulk oil, both in eighteen eighty six. By nineteen oh three, Narragansett is the world's largest and fastest tanker at twelve and a half thousand summer deadweight tons and thirteen knots. And it goes right up to 2003. No single hull tankers continue transporting oil. Now. The thing is, he obviously couldn't find a picture of. Elizabeth Watts, but he found a very similar ship. And he shows how the original tankers were built. They're kind of multi-hulled ships because they have a tank sealed inside the wooden hulls. And it goes through. It is a really cool book. And if you want to understand some of the stuff for World War II and World War I and tankers going on there, you want to have this book. If you want a book which is a different read and you just want to understand more about marine engine development, about ship design, you want this book. Um, it's just, it's well written. It even has all the stuff about what tankers were converted for in World War II, escort carriers, and explains why tankers fit that role well. It also looks at various other ships which were converted tankers for war. It's just a very, very cool book. And I know I keep repeating myself on that, but I really liked it. I've had it for about two weeks, and I've enjoyed every time I've managed to sit down and read it, which is probably more often than my dogs now, because they might complain it was it was time I should have been walking them. Hmm. 
Sergeant Tanaka, Doug Clark, have you reviewed exploding fuel tanks? Saga of technology that changed the course of the Pacific Air Wing by Richard L. Dunn. I have read it. I've got it somewhere, but I don't think I reviewed it. I think I've loaned it out to a student at the moment. I think one of my aero students is borrowing it. Right, later on, this video is sponsored by Royal Dutch Shell. I wish I could do with the money. Remember, I've got a. I, I, I remember, at the moment, I have got a car to replace. That's, you know, that's fun. I've got a. You know, I could do with Shell sponsoring me. I could do with Iron Brew sponsoring me. And thank you, Stafford. That's no cunt to you. I know you, you do wonderful things. And everyone else does wonderful things. And there's no. Not comment for super chats or anything. It's just a case of. Yeah, I, I, I was. Let, let's put it this way. I spent this morning doing some car hunting research. And doing sums. Vision. The USN went uh, from 13 to 12 inch because the 12 inch fired faster and was more accurate. Yep. Also, there wasn't really an advantage of the 13 inch. Trent Langham, 16 and a half inch, 419.1 millimeters, uh, as far as guns concerned. You see, I could actually see someone going with a 420 millimeter gun. I could do, see them doing that, but I can't see someone going for a 419 millimeter gun. Just a bit weird. As Seneca Nero says, Yeah. Also, from correctly, from our lives, uh, well, didn't uh, late Papa Clark work on some tank construction? Yeah, <laughs> my dad did a lot of tank construction. Plus, if you search uh, Douglas Clark on Google, okay, I I think you can, f uh, uh, and I think if you do Douglas Clark Panorama, I think it was, he did. A, he's in a t entire TV program about toy tankers where he takes you all around them and explains it. He was the expert they got in to review them because he was a Lloyd surveyor and all sorts of other things. He was an incredibly qualified naval architect and he scared the bejesus out of most most ship companies because if he turned up and said your ship was good, you were fine. If he turned up and said it was bad, you were lucky if you got insurance. Furikin, does it cover self-flexing and retentioning liquid transports? Yes, it covers it all. It's actually it's a it's a really cool book. And no matter what you're looking for, it goes into it to an ex uh, it, it doesn't do it mass it go into in massive detail, but it covers it in the broad strokes and gi it gives you a good overview. Right today, I have no idea what to send a response for uh, in response to my comment. I understood none of it. Uh, if you remind me what your comment was, I'll try and do it better. A brightest, a uh, brightest day as a summoning builder. All I hear are big targets. Yeah, <laughs> I get that. <laughs> I get that. Thank you, Sean V. <sighs> Larry Shradowski, what do you think late 30s British naval fighters would perform in combat early in the war if the Ministry decided to continue developing fuel injection for aircraft engines? A lot better. We can't, you can't say how much, because it depends on how effective the engines are developed. But if they manage to keep going with injection engines, then we're probably looking at get, having those 300, 400 extra horsepower at the beginning of World War One, Because the British engine... This is the thing people don't understand. Britain, uh, the British engine development is hampered by that decision, but we're still getting power up engines as powerful as old people are with injection. So, if you'd had that decision not taken, you'd probably have had far more powerful engines available. You probably would have, yes. I'm oh, sorry. Sister's just messaged me about why she's banging next door. Hmm. <clears throat> That's Rossi. 
What? No, I'll answer that one. Come on, Cameron. If the US had developed stall jets and ramps when the RM did the steam catapult, would they have gone with Congress forced the insidious tech? Uh, insidious tech? Potentially. Mm, Congress do like do like to uh, specialize in things which are focused on the US, but they might not have. Ali Dan and Wright. Thank you, sir. Nice to hear everyone. I read somewhere that the Japanese had a fuel transport plane. Yes, and they weren't the only ones. This transport, SA Northumbria really was emblematic of the UK at the time. Probably. Yeah. Man, this is great. And eventually you get to something like Seawise Giant. Fully laden six. And a six hundred or six hundred and fifty-seven thousand tons. I do not want to think about what can carry what can fit, uh, how many World War Two era tankers would take it would take to carry four point one million barrels. I don't want to think about that one. I don't know if the car market in the US represents conditions in the UK. With actually no new inventory, prices on used vehicles as high or even higher than new. So you look at Toyota or Lexus though. I'm looking at Subaru, and I'm looking at Toyota, and I have to say I am looking at Volvo, because uh, those are the three I've, I, I've liked of the ones I've driven in times. Frank Sonner, to see. Are there any good ideas you see about ships in the sci-fi that are done for last, but may actually be a good idea? Hmm. Hmm. Which book should I grab for that one? The trouble is the one I the one I would say is there is some good ideas in Stargate. I do like some of the ideas they have in Stargate. I especially liked the turret arrangement on the Infinity, and I thought that made a lot of sense. I'm surprised she only had a single big gun, but a big turret. Uh, but there again, she's an exploration vessel, so that perhaps make uh, that makes sense. But I would have, you see, it, 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 the thing is, this is me. If I'd been designing the Infinity, a she'd have had two biodomes. B, she uh, they would have had metal shielding that I could deploy over them because if she's going to go into a sun to recharge anyway, that seems obvious. Uh, yes, I want to have my full electronic shielding and have all that 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 shield capability. Yes, and but why would I rely on that? Because I, you know, this is the trouble with the um, very adv uh, the advanced race with the Atlanteans. They seem to have no concept of the idea of something going wrong or not working perfectly to plan. And I would have had at least two primary turrets. It's fine for them to be both forward firing in a spaceship because honestly, you're covering 360. You're trying to cover 360, 360. It's just you're always going to have a space you can't cover. But the point is, you can maneuver in 360 degrees, unlike uh, unlike a ship. So you can change that. So I would have liked her to have a main turret, top and uh, uh, top and uh, you know, top and tail sort of thing. I would have liked her. To, she had good secondary turret arrangements. Um, I was always surprised she didn't have any sort of missile launcher because, again, I'd afford a ship which is going through space where they literally have factory ships running in advance which are putting down Stargates Could, and is supposed to be going out there for an infinitely long time and recharging herself. You'd think she'd have some sort of system not just for repairing of her engines more than the automated robot, etc., but also have some sort of manuf on-board manufacturing ability that can manufacture spare parts, etc., just in case the Stargate gets damaged or something else on the uh, hub. And this, again, is the problem with the Atlanteans. So Infinity has these l amazing things in her. She's a really lovely ship. But she has obvious flaws, which you can tell are written as part of the story and do make her, in a way, more adorable. But she's also still... There are things I would fix. <laughs> I tell you, should HMS Century have been converted to an aircraft repair ship? Mm. 
Sim Richards. Hey Doc, the QAs with 18 inch guns, what caliber would they be? Probably 45 caliber. Let's be honest, the British are obsessed with that during that period. Uh, maybe, maybe they go up to 48, but probably 40, uh, 42, 45 caliber would be that. And I, I, I would always think if you're going for an 18 inch gun, you probably end up going 45. But maybe 42s, because again, it's 42, 45 is what the British are obsessed with in this period. That's that's definitely not infinity. Infinity is Halo. Yeah, sorry, getting my starships confused. Infinity. Uh, you see the trouble. This is the trouble because I was watching the video in of Infinity earlier, so I do apologize for that one. I was getting Destiny and Infinity confused. Confused. Infinity is quite cool. I like Infinity. I just wish they'd fix. Uh, again, with Infinity though, there are certain things about it I'd fix. Right, you've mentioned a lot of sci-fi universe fleets have unbalanced fleets. Babylon 5 Earth fleet has dreadnoughts, cruisers, fighters. In the background are Olympus-class corvettes, small escort ships. Yeah. Mm, I have to admit the Babylon 5, as Jamie will regularly remind me, because Babylon 5 is his favourite ever show. I swear. I, 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 I honestly... I, I haven't ever... Asked him the origins of the naming of his daughters, but I do wonder if they can, they are inspired by Babylon Five. Um, but he's it, you know it's lovely. That's a joke, by the way. Just gonna put that out before he sends his kangaroo assassins after me. It was a joke, Jamie. But he's cool. Definitely tell Drak to call the bomb squad because he has a hazardous Oberth class ship model next to a swordfish model. Oberths are made from weapons grade explodium. Hmm. Peter Dawson, German engines tend to be in a range of 30 to 40 litres for the DB range. You know, the most important British engine was the RM Merlin with 27 millilitres. Hmm. Yeah. Come on, Cameron. More important than fuel transport planes, the, the Canadians had beer transport fighters model too. Not just the Canadians. Beer transport fighters. Do not, do not forget how important they are. And possibly there were some iron brew transport fighters, but that's a that's a story which may or may not be myth, but to us who drink the brew is an important one. Hmm. Jimmy, there was a Captain Harlock ship with turrets that, that had bits moving around the ship so they could cover all angles. Hmm, cool. Now, do you want a Stargate version of the BSG Pegasus with its manufacturing capacity? Hmm, possibly. To an, not to an, not manufacturing fighters, but certainly capable of manufacturing missiles. Also, another thing: if I've got a ship as the Destiny was, sorry, I'm forgetting it wrong earlier. The Destiny was. Going off again around space. Orange. Why am I parking my freaking shuttles on the outside of my ship? Why? What would possess me not to have a hangar? I'm sorry. This is the first thing. A, I'm going to want to maintain them. B, and this is the really important thing. B, if they're on the outside of the ship and I go into a sun to charge it, I'm better going to have to protect them with the shielding. This is all stuff which is going to use power, which I want to be charging me. It's inefficient. I'm already building a sodding great big ship anyway. How much effort is it to include a hangar? It's big enough. It's got a stargate inside it. And so many layers that people take ages to find the freaking bridge. Again, which I will never understand, because I'd have thought, in, uh, this is just me, but military boarding party boards a ship. Maybe it's because they're the US Air Force. Maybe that's a problem. But there are some US Marines there, so they have this, doc they do have an understanding of ships. And the US Air Force were talking about in terms of run their own spaceships. Where is the bridge? Usually on this ship. 
Does this space look like bridge? No. Okay, so we are looking for a command and control center. Let us wander round ship. And admittedly, you find a locked door at the top, which you maybe or maybe you maybe can or cannot access. But you soon figure out that's the, probably where the bridge is, in which case you start working out how to access it. Maybe ask the computer, how do we access bridge? Hmm. Hello, MC Legend 13. So the lack of complex uh, predictive firing geometry and firing solution is unrealistic. Uh, what was that one about? Ah, the expanse. Hmm. Don't show. I still wonder how and what beer carrying fighter would look like. Uh, as imagine a Spitfire with beer barrels stuck on each wing. You love my rants about sci-fi ships. There are probably going to be a few of those today. So let's start off with one about normal warships quickly while we're there. British Warships by John Roberts. It is a book which has something in it which I can use to keep even the most ardent naval historian quiet if I need to if I need some peace. So I can put this out I can scramble this out and it will keep them amused for hours. That is of course HMS Warspoke. And if we go inside Well That of course is Ark Royal. And then turn over this page. Oh. That is also Ark Royal. So it goes Warspite, Ark Royal, Ark Royal. And it has others in it which are equally enjoyable and distracting for hours and hours on end oh yes including lots and lots of destroyer designs including this very pretty one of uh, one of the most wonderful ships in world war ii and this design is of course inaccurate because it shows how if a bow attaches if it not as it should be, rather than a normal scenario of where's my new bow? I'd like a new bow, please. I just used mine. At which point people go, um, excuse me, um, your bow is not supposed to be an expendable asset, at which point she goes, Why not? And they look at her funny and go, Because it's not supposed to be. And she goes again, Why not? But no, this is a wonderful book by John Roberts, and if you haven't got it, well, my question is going to be the same about, uh, same as HMS Eskimo's question about why her bow should be always attached. Why not? It's gorgeous. That's a great starting point. There are lots of specific books about the Black Swan class, about HMS Birmingham, about uh, uh, some of the cruisers, etc. Specific in-depth plans. There's even one about HMS Cossack. They are all lovely and wonderful, but this one's the good one to get the start as your starting point. Look, MC Legend 13H, will you ever cover sci fi from the Halo game franchise? Uh, probably. I'm trying to get. I want to source a decent book before I really did it because I do like the Halo game um, ships. And I have played a fair amount of Halo in my time because, believe it or not, in one of the organizations I work have worked for and work with still a lot, there is a lot of downtime. And usually that downtime involves an Xbox or various versions of PlayStation. And Halo has been a constant companion. Especially as people always tend to presume I'm not going to be that good. In which case, I am absolutely atrocious until money becomes involved. 
Um. Curious. Okay, Doc Talking Sci-Fi. What do you think of sky drivers from Marine from UFO, possibly? It's a nice idea. I, I wouldn't really want to try it, but it's a nice idea. Let's take it on. Have you seen the old Parfait News footage of HMS Formidable? Yes. I don't take a strong way, Knight, but I'm friends with Jamie. <laughs> He is a walking, talking <laughs> parfait news footage archive <laughs> index. <laughs> He's wonderful. It's one of his latter known skills. Oh. Hi, Anuk. <laughs> Sam Thompson, why Eskimo is the real inspiration for the Define in Star Trek? More than likely. I like ships' cutaways. It makes me appreciate how stuff is placed aside, like the Yorktown cutaways and those are submarines. Yeah. That's actually... Why not? It's not being translated to Polish yet. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, how, email John Roberts and get him to translate, uh, translate it to Polish. Well, it's absolutely atrocious until money becomes involved. Yes. It's, it, it's a, it, it, I suddenly get a very run of good luck. And me? A shark? Never. I'd never be a shark. I'm a naval historian. We are all known for being nice and polite and warm and cuddly and friendly and everyone wants to be our pal. <laughs> And everyone also always thinks we're terrible at computer games because we say things like, I prefer to play Total War. I do prefer to play Total War. That doesn't mean I have bad hand-eye coordination, though. That just means I prefer strategy games where I get to wind up large groups of people. X1, the Royal Navy's Mystery Submarine by Roger Branfield Crook. Um... Brownfield Cook. And um, this is one of those books which is really, really interesting if you like submarines. And I know there is someone on here who does like submarines because they I let me just make sure I pronounce them the their handle correctly. Uh, do, 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 do. uh Brightest Day. Which is spelt with a four instead of an A instead of in the day, enjoys submarines. And this one is a book you would like if you like submarines. You're going to like if you like ship design. It's got plans, it's got pictures, it's got lots and lots of interesting text in it, and lots and lots of good analysis, including this about the color scheme. X1 carried a variety of paint fishes, uh, finishes, and her crew certainly had a great deal of free time in harbour to repaint the ship. Given the total absence of specific records on the subject, the following colour schemes are indicative only, based on analysis of the photographic record on the ship's logbooks. This graphic record, uh, this analysis is complicated by the fact that only a small number of photographs are actually dated, and in some cases these dates appear incorrect. For example, one of the aerial views of X1 at sea in the Mediterranean is described as the 4th of December 1928. But a log shows on that day her crew had gone ashore and the ship was beginning her annual refit. Similarly, a scene described as X1 in harbour in 1931 shows her in the company of several major vessels at a time when she seldom left the dockside. Colours actually used are difficult to deduce from black and white photography. But there are pointers elsewhere. And of course, this is X1. It's an interesting idea of a ship. And that's the point with the X1. It is an interesting idea of a ship. Also goes into the Mayer scandal, also a Mayer scandal 1927. X1 featured heavily in the spy scandal concerning retired commander Colin Mayers. Not only were top secret plans of ships found in his possession, 
But it's clear that many of the techniques pioneered by X1, such as the use of active anesthetic, were intimately known to the commander and might feature in any of his planned future commercial activities. Retired naval commander Colin Mayers, lately commander of the submarine M2, was arrested at Euston Railway Station Hotel, 9th of the 16th, 17th March, 1977, to charge under Section 2 of the Official Secrets Act, 1911. The facts as presented to Naval Intelligence MFO suggested that he was in the pay of a foreign power. When Mayer's home in Barrow was searched the next day, among the cachet of secret documents discovered in his possession was a plan of X-1 and details of trials which would have involved X-1, such as submarine aesthetic and the tactical functions of fleet submarines. Remounted as Bow Police uh, Street Police Court, but surprisingly released on bail by the magistrate, Commander Mayers appeared in the Central Criminal Court on the 7th of April 1927, charged with passing confidential information on to, to the Japanese naval attaché in London. Born in Temerera, British Guiana, to mixed-race parents on the 4th of February 1891, after service with the first submarine flotilla in the old B-class boat, Colin Mayers had served on the Grand Fleet staff during the Great War as an expert on the Dutch language. Presumably in case fleet action involved deliberate or accidental incursions into Dutch territorial waters, before commanding the submarines L11, M3, and lately, uh, lastly, M2. After his attachment to submarine base at HMS Dolphin, Fort Blockhouse, Commander Mayer's duties had been to train submarine crews, but also to investigate and report on all new and experimental gear fitted to submarines for trials at Fort Blockhouse. It was once described by a senior officer as knowing more about modern submarines than any officer in the Navy. A glowing reference provided by Admiral Max Horton in August 1926, Mayers was described as being called upon for advice and remarks on reports by submarines in other flotillas and abroad. He had shown exceptional ability and an astonishing grasp of every technical detail, and had been entrusted with rewriting and revising the official submarine uh, instruction manual. He also spect his own specialty seemed to have been wireless technography and some submerged communications. Admiral Halton ended uh, with the report of regret that Commander Mayer's forthcoming retirement would be a sad loss for the submarine service. For in 1926, Colin Mayer, seemingly a smarting about being passed over promotion and con contacted several, uh, had contacted several firms about possible employment outside the Navy, including Vickers, Sperry of New York, Electric Boats of, Gov of uh, Groton and Mitsubishi in Japan. Back to his formidable references, it was simple for him to obtain a position at Messrs. Vickers at Baron Furness. Placed on a retirement list at his own request, effective from 26th January 1927, he became an advisor to Vickers Submarine Service at the beginning of February, and moved to Barry with his wife. Seems that he still hankered after foreign appointments, however, and this was, was to lead to his downfall. The day before his retirement, the Admiralty was informed from a delicate and reliable source of the astounding revelation that a fortnight earlier, Commander Goro Hara of the Japanese Naval Office in London had handed Mayers a shopping list of naval information required by the Japanese and was prepared to pay a sum of £300 for this information. On 12th of March, staff at Fort Blockhouse discovered that certain sets of official plans were missing. As Mayers had been the last person to have access to these plans, his last commanding officer diplomatically wrote to him asking if he could suggest where the missing documents might be filed. In the meantime, Admiralty Intelligence in 05 began closing surveillance of the seemingly wayward ex-officer, tapping his phone line and intercepting his mail. From his passport records, they circulated the following description. Height, 5 foot 5 and a half inches. Forehead, broad, eyes, brown, nose, straight, mouth, small, chin, square, complexion, clear, face, full. Distinguishing features, small scar on nose and slight enlargement of rim of left ear. After his arrest, the search of a cupboard in Mayer's home revealed that he had retained the following official naval documents relating to Plans X-1 and the Patrol Summary No. 1. Counterattacks of AS vessels, submarine ASDIC, tactical functions of fleet submarines, submarine automatic inboard and ventilating gear trials, manuals for four different submarines, rough plans for the US submarine V2, blueprints of the M3, H23, L25, H27, L12, plans to convert the M3 to a mine layer, photos of U126, proposals on converting M class boats to carry seaplanes, i.e., the eventual M2, a small plan of a one man submarine christened the Devastator, Copy of a memo on possible conversions of M3 to carry midget submarines, reports on tactics, lecture notes, assorted documents marked secret or confidential, and most angrily, two sheets of paper with the names of Japanese officers. The phone taps and mail interceptions had thrown up a healthy, 
or perhaps unhealthy, correspondence between Commander Mayers and his Japanese contacts in London. It was discovered that he had continued his close friendship with Petty Officer Goldsmith at the Fort's blockhouse, obviously with the intent that the Petty Officer could, would continue to feed him the latest information on submarine developments. Finally, a brother officer admitted that he had found a large file of papers which Mayer had planned to have dispatched to himself at Vickers in Barrow, containing copies of papers on submarine and stick installation experiments. The officer had burned the documents. When he told Mayers of this by phone, the commander had seemingly, uh, seemed mightily relieved. His fate would seem to have been sealed. The authorities would have che would be cheated of prey. However, at his trial, Commander Mayers was adamant that he in no way intended to pass on secret information to the existing or potential hostile country. With only circumstantial evidence on this, the Admiralty was drawn more serious chances and Mayer was charged with minor offences under Section 2 of the Official Secret Act, i.e. unlawfully retaining documents which he was no longer permitted to possess. In the circumstances, it was impossible for Mayers to do anything but admit to such a charge. He was found guilty and bound over. The inevitable upshot was that Vickers immediately divested themselves of the services of the errant commander. It was later to consider legal action against them for breach of contract, but the PRO file has no record of the eventual outcome of this, besides the Admiralty's wish to avoid further embarrassing publicity in the matter. It seemed that Commander still hankered after continuing his training and support function, and he offered his services as an instructor of submarines at the Imperial Japanese Naval College. In this he was to be sad and disappointed, as Commander Hara was doubtful. The Japanese took advice only from the Germans and Italians, but never from the British on submarines. Finally, on the 24th of April 1930, the Japanese Admiralty would, as reported by the same delicate and reliable source, turn him down as unsuitable for the post instructor for reasons of character. In the meantime, the Vice President of Electric Boat Company confirmed that a note from the late unlamented mayors had been duly filed in the waste paper basket. He has confiscated passports, for some reason he had two, self a cause of suspicion, were only returned after Commander Mayors had given his word of honour to the Admiralty to the fact that he would not pass on secret information to the foreigners. Presumably, he then fled the country, which had accused him of preparing to, of preparing to betray it. The last prophetic note on the file uh, concerning ex-commander mayors is a, note, a memo dated from 6 September 1943 from Captain Courtney Young of MI5, reporting that Myers is employed by Metro Golden Mayor as an electrician and lives in Los Angeles. There was, he continued, no evidence of espionage or related activities, and he had no connection with squadron leader of Lutland. We are left to ponder on a possible family connection which gave old misguided Myers this humble employment. And so he disappears from our story and from history. Here you go. Some fun times. That's a good book. Uh, MC of Legend 13H. I believe there is a book on Halo ships. I illust uh, illustrated by the same person who did Star Wars one. So I don't have the book name on top of my head. Well, if anyone finds it, send it to me. Tell me, send me a link. I'll buy it. This is from small people. Uh, let me see for me. How old are you exactly? Hmm, not quite thirty-five. Nice experiment. How does the removal of blocks on H from middle cause the collapse of the wooden cradle? Uh, because they had the cradle wasn't exactly constructed as it should be. It wasn't as strong as it was supposed to be. There were bits missing, basically. This is wrong. People see my pool shot. No, I'm just that bad, but a sport and willing to place a bet for the fun of it. Hmm. No, it's more than someone likes submarines. Well, Melanie, you know. We all, uh, yeah, to be fair, Melanie, the thing is, you like all ships. Whereas there are some people who like, uh, pretty much focus on submarines. With you, it's all ships. Nice to grant. Could the Blackborn Rock have been used as an escort for the Fairy Swordfish? No, I think the Fairy Swordfish wouldn't want to be seen in company with the Blackburn Rock. Fort F4U Corsair by Martin W. Bauman. If you haven't got this book, you're going to want it. I know it's not ship design, but there's enough in Star Wars about World War, based on World War II fighter uh, combat that, frankly, I was going to make a... Uh, I decided to put this book in because... I keep meaning to talk about this book more, and I haven't, so I put it in. It's got great pictures, but most of all, it's got great history. It really does have good his great history. <sighs> hmm. 
Moran. And the chat can not miss any questions. This round could have been worse. Could have been a tank commander who leaks official secrets to the world, uh, world of tanks website because the game annoys you. Hmm. Good. Man, that's a great. What secret info was he charged with passing on? He didn't actually manage to be part of. He didn't manage to prove he passed anything on. He just kept it at home. Very good. You don't need to worry about the leaks to uh, wargaming. Have you seen how many paper ships they use? Could war paper ships. Uh, mm. Cold War paper ships versus Leander and, and KGB. Hmm. No, sorry. So you're younger than myself and I grew up playing Halo. Well, you see, I might have also had an Xbox at home. But to be fair, before that, I also had a Sega. Me I also have a Sega Mega Drive. I still have the Mega Drive and the Xbox. And to be fair. The Mega Drive always got more use than the Xbox, mainly because my mum is a massive fan of Sonic the Hedgehog. And if in doubt, we still can end up playing Sonic the Hedgehog against each other on the Mega Drive to, the, uh, to this day. Jimmy, the Halo chip book I think is called Halo Warfleet, and this very guide to space travel from Halo. It's in stock for about Amazon for about £12. I'll add it to my next book list to buy when I next get, some pay uh, get a paycheck. I know, some people see the naval world divided into submarines and targets. Well, you see, that's a trouble. If your name's HMS Dreadnought, then the submarines are your target in World War One. So, I'm going to have to move this forward to get some light to read it. The rest of the bombers were now 400 yards ahead, and it took me a long, excruciating minutes to gain my attack position again. How on their right size, side? I realized it's impossible to destroy all the bombers alone. I decided to get on the radio and broadcast the location, course, altitude, and speed of the enemy formation. Many flights of friendly fighters were supposed to be in the area, and perhaps some of them might be close enough to join and finish what I had started. After transmitting the blanket broadcast twice, I was almost ready for another attack. My plane started to roll left for the attack when I realized that tracer bullets were whizzing by me. My first thought was that the tail gunners were responsible. A glance in my review mirror cleared up the mystery. A zero was there, pumping arrows at me. At this inspect, I noticed a short while ago, had now grown to a full-sized and very unfriendly airplane. I dropped my throttle while putting the Corsair in a left skid. This decelerating maneuver was designed to catch my attacker by surprise, confuse his aim and cause him to scoot by before he could even recognize my actions and his mistake. Then, when a nemesis appeared in front of me, I would have him at my mercy. This caper had worked well in practice, so I automatically used it. My trigger finger itched while I strained my eyes for the first glimpse of the Jap in my gun sight. It was then that I began to suspect that my attacker was no amateur, because he never flew in front of me. My head swiveled on my shoulders as I fearfully tried to relocate my opponent. There was no sign of anywhere. I then threw the airplane in a right skid, but still could not see him. My friend etc. to visit zero. I did happen to notice that the bombers were now half a mile ahead of me, because I had reduced my speed, hoping the trick zero. Seeing them again dispelled my fear as I returned my thoughts and efforts towards destroying them, more of the, those easy targets. But it, it took several minutes to get, attain a good attacking position again. But traders once more, traders once more began to whiz by and strike my winds. The appearance of the zero was confirmed by a glance in the mirror. Without thinking, I executed the same evasive caper. This eliminated the arrows like before, but again no zero appeared in front. An alternate skid to the right did not reveal the phantom. By now I was getting more angry than frightened. Another such as guy revealed the Betty bombers, but nothing more. Where was the bastard? But seeing those juicy sitting duck bombers crowded the fears from my mind as I resumed the chase. The enemy pilot was apparently an acrobat. He was diving on my tail from higher altitudes and using his excess of speed to loop over me when my skinning maneuver caused him to overrun my plane before he could aim properly. This would explain his quick disappearing and reappearing. I should have suspected his maneuver at the time, as I'd already fought with some acrobatic pilots, I mean, enemy pilots. Amazingly, the whole situation was repeated identically for a third time. However, this time the Zero, having more time to, uh, uh, more than his share of practice, sent a very hostile bullet into the cockpit. He must have been shooting from slightly on my left side because the bullet entered just outboard of the armor plate behind me on the left and shattered the altimeter on the instrument panel. The bullet just missed my arm as it passed through the crook of my elbow. But 
The real danger from the rear now rudely awakened me. I lost my hero complex and devoted my full thoughts towards getting away from the Jap and giving him no further opportunity to kill me. I recall that a few seconds before it was hit, the altimeter registered 17,000 feet. I put the Corsair into a left skid and did a sloppy half roll. I left the throttle wide open and then, when inverted, pointed the airplane straight down. I continued jinking the spoiler's aim as I kept the aircraft on its nose. Early in the war, intelligence people and engineers had been able to get their hands on the Zero 021 fighter that crash landed pretty much intact in a bog and the Aleutians. The Zero was scrutinized from stem to stern, as well as flown by American pilots after being rebuilt at North Island Naval Air Station, in California. Intelligence reports ascertained that the Zero was prone to lose its wings in a high speed dive. Furthermore, if it did survive such a dive, I really doubted if it could hold to not, not hold together in a hard right turning roll pullout. With this in mind, I headed for the earth in a full power vertical plunge. Of course, I had hoped that he would not try to follow me down, but if he did, it was my intention to try to prove or disprove intelligence to theory. My courser quickly attained a high rate of descent. Due perhaps to an overpowering urge to go even faster, just the opposite seemed to occur. My plane hardly seemed to be gaining on the earth far below. I could see the island of Colomrega beneath me, but with no altimeter to tell me where, when to start my pullout, I knew that I had better judge the moment very carefully, or old Hunter would no, grow no older and would become one more MIA. Damn, will my plane hold together? His bullets have struck and could have weakened its structure. Too late now. I'm already in my dive. I was too busy trying to figure out my altitude to be frightened. A glance in my rearview mirror scared me further. The Zero was right with me in the dive. Gosh, he's still after me and still shooting. He must be their highest ace. I'll have to pull this out. To, uh, the, the, I'll have to make this pull out a tough one to finish him. Or maybe me. The volcanic peak of Komangara was helpful in gauging my altitude. At what I guessed to be 2,000 feet, I commenced uh, easing back on the control stick with both hands. When my eyes began to see more grey than light, I refrained from pulling back on the stick further. I froze it in that position while hoping, to, uh, hoping the recovery would continue. When halfway out of the steep dive, I commenced a right rolling turn and could barely see the island shoreline to see beyond. Am I going to make it? The island seems to be coming up at me awfully fast. Perspiration stung my eyes. The strain of gravity prevented me from watching the Jap in the Corsair's mirror. Made it. I leveled off just above the treetops of the jungle and continued my hard right to turn away from the mountain peak and towards the shoreline. As the loads of gravity lessened on my body, I tried to see behind me, hoping to observe the Jap fighter crash. But if he survived, I wanted to get on his tail and give him some arrows in return and show him how he should have hit me. After making a complete turn, there was no sign of, of the Jap. I started worrying that he might be closer under my tail in my blind spot and would start assume me drilling me again. Several swishes of my tail calmed my fear. Another circle of the area revealed no zeros. Hey, what's that? Black smoke began rising on a jungle uh, on about the place where I would have crashed if unsuccessful in my pull-up. Smoke volume rapidly increased and blackness was indicative of a petroleum fire. Hot damn, that just has to be the zero, but I'll never know for sure. I guess I just barely made the recovery, so it seemed impossible that he could have. I guess I can't even claim him as a probable, even though the evidence is pretty conclusive that he crashed. Anyway, he's not around above me. Boy, the fire's really burning fiercely now, and only gasoline can make such a blaze. One more circle of the area for good measure, still not producing an airborne zero. I flew low and the slow of the jungle but could not see through the thick smoke and foliage. The jungle had swallowed them a mystery. A weak thought prodded me to take up the bomber chase again. The Bettys, however, were now out of sight. A glance back in my cockpit revealed a frightening fact. Only 60 gallons of gas registered on my fuel gauge. Golly, I'd better scoot for canal. It's well over 200 nautical miles away, and it's going to be a close on that little gas. I'd better lean out the mixture and pull, uh, pull the RPMs back. After throttling back to an economical cruising setting, I looked at the airplane over as well as possible. This is not easy, since you can only move around so much in a Corsair cockpit. There are four bullet holes in the right wing, one in the wheel well, and three more holes in the, uh, in the same area of the left wing. Aside from the shattered altimeter, I could not see any more holes or damage. Fluid was streaming off the trailing edge of both wings behind the wheel wells. I knew that it had, been, had to be either gasoline or hydraulic fluid. A fluid. I hoped it was the latter. Next, I figured there might be a little gas left in the wing leading edge fuel tanks. Without a gauge in the cockpit for these oil auxiliary tanks, there was no way a pilot could tell when they were empty except to draw fuel from them until the engine spit quit. Quick switch to a fuel tank, a full tank of gas always restored the engine to smooth operation. If the leaking fluid was gasoline, the best practice was to run the engine on the puncture tanks until they were dry. I was happy to get 12 minutes of engine operation from those tanks before I had to switch back to the main. It's a very, very good book. Oh. 
Right. Come on, guys. Re second World War, um, Star Wars and World War II air combat. As a matter of fact, basic fine maneuvers are in the D D6 uh, Star Wars RPG Rebel Alliance Swords book. Hmm, cool. Why does that story remind me of the Yes Prime Minister episode? Mm, most do. Yes Prime Minister has a few good episodes in it. Actually, let me just check something. Uh, let me make sure I've got this Star Wars book. Halo Warfleet. And then we go straight together. Make sure I've got that saved quickly. Ba -da -da -ba -da 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 -da. Ah, yes. A guide to the spacecraft of Halo. And to Basket. Hmm. Landed and secured. Okay. Thanks for that. While seeking, while playing Silent Hunter, I surfaced of sinking entire US Mantle Group to get a better look. As the eye was sinking, it used the final broadside to sink me in one hit. Ouch. Hello, Jack Ray. Um, if Atrus, nice to run. If Atrus Unicorn had been modernized with what was considered, what would have been a limit in terms of jet aircraft? Probably not too different to the other modernized light fleet carriers. Probably we're talking about three dozen aircraft, roughly speaking, in terms of operation of actual operational ability, and some how <coughs> do I put this? And probably some helicopters. At best, <coughs> maybe about two dozen. Hurricane, course, direction, altitude, and speed. BT, take note. Yeah. We can always hope. Tim <coughs> Richards, what's the F4U, the best all round fighter of the Second World War? Someone make that case, but my favourite's always going to be the Hell. It's always going to be the Hellcat. I'm sorry. Uh, the F4U is certainly a very, very good aircraft, but I'm I'm a big fan of the Hellcat. Although there are people who claim the P38, and there are others who go for the Hurricane or the Mosquito or the Hornet, and some some claim the Bowfighter. And of course, there's a fair number who try and claim the Spitfire. Right, Sam Thompson, that story about hoping on having a fuel reminds me of riding a lot rather than a 91 F-250 with a faulty gauge and hoping that we didn't lock, the, uh, lock up the diesel if we ran out. <laughs> Darius Rosky, what do you think of making a new Blackadder season? World War II for Britain. Uh, Battle for Britain. They are in the AA unit and get visited by Lord Flashheart when he uh, bails out after a mutual sh uh, shootdown with a German pilot. Part one. That would be cool, but honestly, I think if I was going to do Blackadder in World War Two, I'd have him as in charge of a hurricane squadron. While Flash Art's in charge of a Spitfire squadron at the same base. K 
come on. You've got to, it, it, that would be have to be the way you do it because it's got to be all Flash Arts flying a Spitfire and Black Adders flying a swordfish for the Navy and the Fleet of Aeron. Oh, that'd be good. Black Adder doing Taranto. With Baldrick as his tail egg, his tail as his observer. <laughs> oh. Well, because actually, if you think about it, then you could actually have the three, because you'd have Baldrick as his telegraphist air gunner in the swordfish. You'd have, oh, I've forgotten his name, as the observer. And Blackadder as the pilot. Or alternatively, Blackadder as the observer. Sitting there going, I hate you all. I'm the most intelligent. Because the observers were traditionally some of the smartest people, as smartest officers in the Navy were recruited to be observers. So that would kind of fit with the Blackadder thing, with him being the observer in a swordfish and having to deal with a pilot who's annoying him. Um, uh, nice well, the question was what model of the jet would the new course limit? Oof. Probably the Sea Hawk. I don't know. There's a few they could probably monitor she could probably take I wouldn't like to try and land a sea vixen on the unicorn. I really wouldn't. So probably the ones before that. I I I could just about see you pulling in a sea vamp a vampire a sea vampire. There it sounds like who would be Stephen Fry? Oh, that's quite easy. If if you went with the swordfish flying scenario with Baldrick as the tail end gun, etc. Then Stephen Fry has got to be Admiral Cunningham, and let's be honest, that's the part he was born to play. Because Stephen, I, I, I we can all imagine Stephen Fry playing Admiral Cunningham. Hmm. And of course, Bob would be a wren, I presume. Sea venom, probably. Kieran, Cal, and Cameron. Uh, Hugh Laurie is the pilot, and Stephen Fry as the uh, ship's captain. And Black Adder's Rowan Atkinson, yes. Yeah, I'm going to do this one. Okay. This is an old book, so if you can find it, you're very, very lucky. But I wanted to put this in this one because it's always worth a find. Because it's British warship design in World War II. Selected papers by the transactions of the Royal Institute of Natural Architects. And I'm always trying to sell this, tell people this book because I want people looking for this book because it's a good one. And originally published in 1947. This edition published in 1983. Which means, as they are, they did it thirty six years. Honestly, they should have done another version in twenty nineteen, but they didn't. And it has such topics as ships of the invasion fleet, with all the plans, etc. But the point is, if you're a naval architect or you're studying naval architecture, this is actually the reports on these things written by the naval architects who built them. Including British submarine design during the war, merchant aircraft carrier ships, ships of the invasion fleet, corvettes and frigates, coastal force design, and notes from land coast. The interesting thing about the merchant aircraft carrier ships, 40, which starts on 43, Yes, of course, merchant aircraft carriers, there are lots of people who come with ideas claiming who came up with them. 
And it's kind of interesting when you start to read it. Uh, start reading it. Merchant ship aircraft carriers were first officially considered at the beginning of 1942, but it was not until towards the middle of the year that their immediate development became both apparent and urgent. Once accepted, development of the proposals proceeded very rapidly. No time was lost in issuing the necessary instructions for the construction of two vessels to be put in hand, ready for service in early spring 1943. It was, however, never intended that introduction should be more than an interim measure in the anti-submarine campaign. Primarily, for defensive reconnaissance duties with the convoys, they satisfied the requirement of a short-term policy and filled the gap until naval auxiliary carriers could became available, a program of which was just then beginning to take shape in both this country and the United States. Preliminary naval staff requirements specified that the second vessel should be of a speed of 14 to 15 knots and have dimensions capable of providing for a flight deck of no less than 490 feet by 62 feet and a hangar space for the housing of at least six fighter aircraft. These vessels building or in service, which could have those vessels building or service, which could have satisfied those requirements, were already allocated for other equally important duties. Consequently, with the design and production of MAC vessels becoming the response of the Admiralty, Merchant Shipping Department, capacity for their construction had to be found in yards under the department's control. The majority of these, however, were unfamiliar with naval equipment and generally physically incapable of producing naval vessels having dimensions that could meet those specific needs. From a survey of berth capacity then becoming available, and with regard to a number of vessels required, with which, uh, which had increased from an initial order of two to a total of six within a period of four weeks, and also the dates they were required in service, it was obvious that nothing of larger dimensions than the standard cargo tramp could be produced from the merchant shipyards. Modified proposals based on the conversion of the ship standard tramp were submitted to the naval staff, who not only acknowledged uh, not, not only acknowledged the difficulties placed before them, but despite a not altogether a unanimous reception, boldly agreed to modifications and recast their requirement to cover the provisional flight deck of not less than 390 feet, so it's dropped by 100 feet, and length uh, length by 62 foot breadth. They want the breadth. They're happy to accept 100 foot length or less length, but they want the breadth. A hangar for accommodation of four swordfish, and the speed of vessel and service have been fair weather to be not less than 11 knots. What is interesting is you very quickly start to realise that the specifications were a there were unofficial specifications running around once you read this uh, this book but also you start to realize very quickly that when the official specifications come in one of the stories that likes people oh i dropped the concept and i suggested it da, 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 and offered my ships they were already hunting it for the time so in the nicest way you were led and became a patsy my dear mate but never get that let that get in the way of good history of a good story I assume my orange cat just jumped up and paused the video by rubbing on the earphone and acti activating the touchpad. <laughs> Dr. Clark, do you own Red Operation Dracula, the invasion of Rangoon in 1945? Uh, yeah, I have it somewhere. And is it any good? Um, I haven't finished it, but uh, so far, but I, so what I've read is quite good. I think it's up in my bedroom at the moment, being in red. Right then. Battlestar Galactica. One of the books I actually showed at the beginning when we went all weird. Now this is cool because this book has all the designs in it. And if you look for it down below, you'll see it as designing spaceships. Battlestar Galactica designing spaceships. And it is really all about where the designs came from, how they came about, what they were looking for when they were designing them, what shapes. And you have to remember, it's also, it's divided into three sections. The original series, the reimagined series, and Blob and Chrome. Now...
what you realise with Blood and Chrome is that, well, Galactica is uh, a rather gorgeous looking ship once you're in Blood and Chrome. I actually quite like her. And it's just, it's a wonderful book. It has little details, like, following on from the pop culture success of Star Wars in 1997, 1977, the original Battlestar Galactica brought unparalleled visual effects visually to the small screen in 1978. John Dickestra of Industrial Light and Magic was instrumental in establishing the techniques that allowed George Lucas' science fiction epic to depict existing exciting state battles between rebel X-Wings and Imperial TIE Fighters. When his company, Abergy Inc., came to the visual effects of Battlestar Galactica, it was on the foundations of this work that Dickestia um, created the signature dogfights between Colonial Vipers and Cylon Raiders. These battle sequences were dynamic and became a defining fixture of the series, and something the producers of the reimagined Battlestar Galactica were keen to emulate in the new show. However, there'd be a huge difference in the execution of these effects and in design of one key ship, the Cylon Raider. And they show you all the potential designs they looked at for a Cylon radar, a radar, and when it, came, you know, what they were looking about, what its options could be. What it could do. Even has blocking out of it, and all those uh, and all sorts of things looked into what it would be and what it would be like. It is a really, really cool book, and it's really, really detailed. George Newman, true fact, Greg Byington served as technical advisor to the television program based on his memoirs, and even appeared in three of the episodes. Cool. Hello, Rapid. No, Zach. Um... Remember, I wondered what a six turret Moltke will be like, and if any good. The trouble is, if you're making it a six turret ship, and this is the reality of a six turret design, you're adding in that weight, so you're going to lose speed. So I'm presuming you're going for the multi class battle cruiser when you're talking about six turrets. Because the current design, the standard design from Mokka is a five turret design. And. They are good looking ships, they're capable ships. But. The thing is, if you're doing it for a six turret design, it's. Well, you're having probably putting a super firing gun forward as your sixth gun, and that's going to increase your weight. As it is, you can see the issues the Germans have with engine design and that they still got the wing turrets. And that they're using them like they're using them. I'll get a Moltke. I'll, I'll get them of the uh, Moltke herself up as a picture.
Oh, hello. That's come up right in front of my face. There you go. There is a Mokka. I don't think a six gun design really helps her. A redesign might help her, but not a six gun design. Now, typically, always had the impression that Silent Raider was a significantly larger vessel, having a crew of three versus one of the Viper. Viper. It does seem to be. Now, that's always my theory, is that the... Gal uh, <sighs> that the Cylon is more... Uh, the Cylon vessel is a more long-range strike aircraft. It's kind of like it's a reverse of... The X-Wing TIE Fighter Paradox of Star Wars. In that, theoretically, the Cylon Raider is a long-range strike fighter. It's a Mosquito. It's a light bomber. Um, and, and the Viper is the air defense fighter. So it's a Spitfire versus Mosquito scenario. Dear Chain 9, my fiancé is Romanian. Any thoughts of the go in class Corvette from the French that Romania is meant to be buying? I looked at their current fleet and there's surprisingly a couple of Type 22s. go -in will be a fine Corvette. Basically, your options in that market are you either go big and buy a Type 31 or you go small and you buy a, uh, buy a go -in. That's what's available at the moment. Um... I do keep seeing interesting thing where people go, oh, we should be buying Miko 300s instead of Type 31s and all these things. And I go, well, that's a completely different role. If you want to buy a Miko, that's lovely. But your Miko equivalent in your R in the Royal Navy is a Type 26. In which case, what you're really saying is we want to buy more Type 26s. Because why are we buying a Miko? Do we need a general purpose frigate to fill in the air defense role? No, we have the Type 45s. So that's a capability we don't need. What do we need? We do need more type. We do need more type twenty sixes, but we also need forward deployed ships, which are cheap and easy to maintain forward. Which is why we're buying the type thirty ones. So honestly, you need more type twenty sixes, and you need more type thirty ones, and probably more type thirty twos when they come along. I would like to be buying at least six type thirty ones. I'd like to be buying twelve type twenty sixes. This is why I don't want to buy any more ships, any more types of ships, because also. I don't want the expense of supplying and supporting them. If you look at it, well, the Britain, the Royal Navy's trying to stand by us down. That makes sense. And for Romania, the Gowins will be fine. For what they want them to do, they're going to be perfectly fine. Uh, they're probably go it's going to be their issue is going to be only replacing the Type Twenty Twos and what they're going to do with them, what they're going to go for to replace them, because the Type Twenty Twos have been their big general purpose ship and actually. If I was the Romanians, I'd be very tempted to go up to the Canadians right now and go, mm hmm because I think the Canadian version of Type 26 is probably the better fit for replacing the Type 22s for the Romanians than the British version of Type 26. Inga, uh, in winter. Again, doors on the landing deck for battle stars. Come on. Uh, I'm not getting into that. It's just me. Yeah. So, what would an Elbonian super dreadnought look like? It has to be sound good, but trash in reality. German turbines. And German coal supply. American 40, first generation 14 inch guns. Uh, 
double turrets, though, and four of them. Sounds good, but Queen Elizabeth class already in existence. So basically what the Greeks were building in, the Germ in Germany. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, Mogbo to the left, so why is he be firing turrets sternwards? Weight. Engine distribution and weight. And also, if you look at it, you'll see that the super firing turret is the same height as the main battery guns. It's that they've cut down the hull as part of the weight and the, st and the stern for speed. And so that's given them the extra level below to put in the next turret. So, it, rather than really having a super firing, they've got to cut down. Because whilst that technically is super firing over that, if you look at it, that gun's pretty much the same level as that one, that one, and that one. In fact, it is pretty much the same level as the forward gun. And there's slight difference in looks, but it's an angle of the photograph. Rempola, supposedly Germany was afraid the French and British and French would crack down if the Sarmus guns were bigger than the Lynch. Was the, what was the biggest they could have politically in industry? Industry. Well, actually, no. That that was the biggest they could do industri industrially. The French, uh, the Germans couldn't build a bigger gun than the eleven-inch gun when they built the Scharn horse. That's the thing. That that there is this all this sort of myth and this all this cover of oh they were doing it to appease the British and the French and all this. The British and the French. Honestly, the Royal Navy would have preferred the Shan Horse to come up with a bigger gun. Because, if you think about it, for people like Admiral Henderson, who were trying to fight the freaking 14-inch gun idea, if the Germans had produced a ship with a 15-inch gun, whoa Hello! Are you... Can you stop being stupid? Can you allow us to build up... We've got 16-inch we've got guns ready to go. 15-inch guns ready to go. Let's go. Mush, mush, mush. Get out my way. Allow me to build something decent would have happened. But no. The biggest the Germans could build, and this was part of the arrogance which led to the British Chatfield especially arguing for the 14 inch, is the 11 inch gun of the Sharnos, which was what the industrial league could get build. Hmm. I liked Babylon 5 because, according to text specs, most of the hulls on the rest of, on the ships were uh, appropriately massive and thick. That is good. Right then. Um, building wooden fighting ships. James Doran and James Moore. Always a good book. Always a fun one to read. All the details in here about carpentry, all the plans of how you built the ship. How it be laid out, how it be designed, how it be structured. It's a really, really cool introduction to construction of wooden ships and the realities of it. And it can give you a whole different perspective on naval warfare in the Napoleonic era. Because you start to realise what big investments these ships were. Hurricane, yeah. Well, just again, imagine if HMS Dreadnought had had the 14-inch gun from Ellswick Ordnance Company, then maybe Vickers would have stopped being so obsessed with the 14-inch gun. We could always hope. I put my shoes down. Or we could always hope. Your lighting makes your look your shirt look as if it's glowing. Hmm. Well, it's a cool ACDC shirt, so let's be honest. That's good. And I'm I, I'm hoping the lighting is better, because I've got the ring thing up facing away from me, because if it's facing towards me, frankly... Well, this is what happens if it's facing towards me. I surrender. 
Um, so yeah, not doing that. So it's facing away from me. <sighs> hmm. Not sure that's okay. Better or should be angled a bit more down. Yeah, angled a bit more down. That's better. <sighs> Trickin, I preferred Battlestar Galactica because of kinetics. Mm. I can see that. Right. Italian battleships. Conte di Cavour and Dulio classes. We keep talking about Taranto. We talk about all these things. Well, these ships, you want to know about them? Look them up. This is an excellent book. It's got some beautiful maps in it and beautiful oh, well, drawings in it and beautiful discussions of them. And I like these classes. I really do. It even has this. Basically, what parts of the ships were removed, changed, altered in the reconstructions. Mm -hmm. Look at how much good gone. Um. It's just, they're just beautiful. And it's well written. It's beautifully laid out. It's... On both of the battleship classes, there were three main ammunition storage spaces. One four, corresponding to the four, two forward main turrets, numbers one and two. One midships below number three main gun turret. And one aft corresponding to the two after three or five millimeter guns. Each space was in turn divided into two levels. Where in the upper level, the three or five millimeter firing charges were stowed in the magazine. In the lower level, where the projectiles themselves in the shell, uh, shell room. An adjacent space contained the cases and projectiles for the medium caliber guns. The case and ammunition for the small caliber guns were stowed in separate magazines away from the main ammunition storage. On the Cavour class, upon entering to service, total ammunition capacity was 1,300 rounds of 305mm, equal to 100 rounds per gun. Which makes sense. 3,600 of 120mm, and 3,360 of 76mm. On the Dulio class, the capacity was uh, 1,144 uh, 1, rounds of 305mm guns, uh, ammunition, 3,440 of 152mm, and 5,265 of 76mm. All the magazines were insulated, fitted with remote thermometers to control temperature from a distance, with protected, uh, protected electric writing, lighting, sprinkler systems to extinguish any small fires, and large seawater pumps controlled from outside the compartments themselves to quickly flood them if necessary for safety reasons. It's a gorgeous book. Ooh. Now and then the mic drops off when you're uh, reading, but still audible. Okay. Well. Hopefully, that does the job. If it doesn't, tell me. Mitch Lowe, it's ACDC. I spent too much time in the engine room. I think motor generator when I see that. Rather, wooden ships are more inherently incompatible. How do they limit that? Mm, by being very, very careful, mostly. But also by, well, the magazine room especially was very careful. 
but also because have you ever tried to get a really thick piece of wood burning? It's not as combustible as you necessarily think it is. They are more combustible than steel, but it still takes effort. I like lightning. I liked lighting on your road trip when it looked like the iron brew had a radioactive glow. <laughs> oh. One of my friends keeps complaining this stuff it looks radioactive. Mm -hmm. You're allowed to say Italian battleships look beautiful. You're not allowed to say that. If you're British, you are allowed to say look beautiful. You're not allowed to say they look better than the British. Uh, better, uh, better able to fight than the British, but you're allowed to say they look beautiful. That's a great one. So if Atreus got um, Unicorn got modernized, she may not be able to operate anything before the hand of the sea venoms. But what helicopters would you expect her to operate? Anything that she wanted to. She could operate pretty much. She might actually become a helicopter carrier at some point. Uh, she might have actually ended up going along with Bulwark and Albion in, in terms of the LPH duties. As I see, thoughts on the three twenty millimeter on guns on uh, Italian battleships. Was there any credit or to it, or should they have stayed with the three hundred five? Hmm, it's useful. It's useful. It's an it, it, it gives you an extra shot and an extra firepower, which is let's put it this way: it gives you significant. It gives you enough of a capability boost without being detriment enough to your stowage that it's useful. It's cost efficient. It's not quite the same, but it's cost efficient. Right. Be back in a second. Someone's just knocked on my door. And I'm going to try and make... This is... Well, basically, this will keep you all amused for a second while I disappear. Coming, coming, coming. Hello. Why do you want me? Oh, something's fallen over. I'll be back in a second. Literally just going to do something with fallen over. It's a bright moon tonight. That may or may not be helpful to me later. Fine. Back you go, piece of wood. Don't want you taking over for me. Okay. Ooh. I was asking, Italian battleships look better and fight better than French battleships. They do. How does your family feel about partial credit? Uh, well, thank you for the congratulations of 7,000 subscribers. And you don't get partial credit in my family. So it's 13,000 or bust. Well, actually, no, it's not technically 13,000. I have to get to at least 8,000 to satisfy the side bet my mum has made. Because apparently my mum has made a side bet. And who knows? I, 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 I'm not sure who else has made side bets, but... um. I'm fairly sure every single family member has made some side bits. It's the kind of family we are. We don't bet. We don't. We don't bet money or the, the, do gambling like that. But family only have bragging rights and consequence bets, i.e. things where you have to end up doing people's chores, etc. if it goes right, if you don't win, and those sort of things. They are quite common in my family. Ooh. 
Right then. I'm going to do that book next, and then I'll work through... Then I'll have... Oh, good lord. If I do that book, then I have only five more books to go. And then it'll just be questions to the end. Good lord. I'm really racing through the books tonight. Ba -da -da -da. But there again, it is eight o'clock, and I'm thinking this would be it takes about ten this evening. So, um, I'm often asked by people how to get children addicted addict to naval history. That literally is the question I get asked probably second most often on Discord. Uh, various. Mm, actually, it's it's, it's about a. 45 55 split of its if its mums or dads asking the question but a lot of mums seem to be as keen on getting their children addicted to naval history as there are dads and well this is a book I tend to recommend to people it's come out and there's a new version called Warships Inside Out but this is the one I've had since I was a kid but there is a new version. Link to it down below. And it's cool. It's got all sorts of ships. Ranging from Age of Sail to Ironclad to... If you really want to blind them with turpits. Kind of like putting turpentine in their eyes, but not, uh, not as clever. But ah, far more beautiful. Yamato. Um, there are modern ships in here. There's even the 1971 California USS California. Mm -hmm. It's a really, really cool book. It's got the Visby in here, which is a nice look at some modern design. And the newer books have even more modern ships in them. And it's just, it, it's worthwhile reading. It's worthwhile looking at. It even has, what was at that time, when this came out. And one of the reasons I got this, I, I was very happy to have this book. <gasps> the Daring Type 45. <gasps> the full graphic. <laughs> I remember seeing this and thinking, that's cool. Can we finish it, please? I wanted I wanted all 12 starters. Yet yeah, noting a theme here, I like the number of 12 for the Royal Navy ships. It does make sense. And I can explain why, but, you know, it basically gives you four operational. If you have 12 destroyers and you have 12 Type 20, if you have 12 Type 20, uh, 12 destroyers in service and 12 Type 26s for anti-summary warfare, and 12 Type 31s for forward presence, and 12 Type 32s for mine sweeping and support, you'd have 48 escorts overall. And you'd usually have available at least 16 vessels operational, 16 in various stages of working up transit and all those things, so you could call them, and 16 in various stages of refit. And that would provide you enough for some decent sized task groups. Yes, that's what we want to think about. Anyway, leaving that to one side. Very cool design. Very glad that it's now wrong, because of course they're going to be getting a C Scepter VLS stuck in here, where they were originally designed to have the uh, Mark 41 VLS. And that'll be good. Be nice. I would have preferred them to be getting the Mark 41 VLS, but economics are economics, and that's what they've gone with. Furry kitten! You know I have cousins watching us. No, 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 no. It's a very, very cool book to start them off. Uh, second, no aunts and uncles. Probably a few aunts and uncles as well. I, I, but mainly it tends to be parents who are worrying about these things.
Mitch Lokes, in my case, it was having three uncles in the USN and visiting North Carolina every summer. Cool. People generally should focus on what they want, not what others think they ought to want. Yes, but people, parents do tend to try and spend a lot of time trying to mould their children into wanting things. And there are ways to get there. <laughs> you know, uh, it is unfinished as the engines need to be replaced, hence the removable access sections. Yeah. As Tim Richards, my grandmother bought me an airfix of the War Spice and I read her history. Uh, read her history and got hooked many, many years ago. Yeah. That happened to a lot of us. Yes, uh, making task groups that will make pe other people think we could do this, but if we piss off the British, the RN will go rock up and that might go badly for us. Ah, uh, yes. The whole thing of task groups. That was the whole point, really, in the TARC 26 video, and the reason I liked doing it, because of the task group uh, uh, things in it. So, I have three more sci-fi books and two World War II books to go. And if you've been watching carefully and checking the list down below, you'll know what those are to go. So, starting off with, we have Star Trek Shipyards by Hero Books. These are Starfleet ships 2151 to 2293. And I have to admit there is one book in this collection which is already going to need to be sort of slightly modified. But... It has cool books in here. and it, I mean, cool ships in here. It's a cool book. Uh, it's got various cargo ships. It's got lots of discussion of the various ships they had. I rather liked the moon transport in here, I have to admit. But it's... How do I put this? This is one of those books which is always worth a read if you're interested in sci-fi. Mainly, I liked it because, honestly, it had the best section I've found so far on the USS Reliant, which is one of my... How do I put this? I like these little ships. If there is a Star Trek game, which I ha did buy the things and also and can play on my system because of it, so I had to buy a special download to allow me to play it because it's so old, because it's Windows 95. And I this the, the light cruisers were always my favourite of the Trek ships to play because they had the best balance of manoeuvrability and combat cable, uh, firepower. I could do really interesting things with them. Which I couldn't with <clears throat> some other systems, which annoyed me. <sighs> but as a result, this is a class which I loved. And this was a class which I wanted to learn more about. And this book answered a lot of books, a lot more about it. And honestly, I have to say that as much as I always enjoyed. To an extent, some of the Star Trek, the Star Trek television programs, and watching those series, especially, well, Next Generation was where I really got into it because that was my era. But then Voyager came along, and DS Nine, and DS Nine was always sort of a favourite one. The smaller ships, the ships like the Fiance in the Starfleet, the ships which are honestly, they are war fighting vessels. The thing is, the big ships. They always are these cruiser status capital ships. They're always going around. But the small ships, you can't really hide it. They don't have the space to do the stuff which this thing has in it so it can go, yes, look at me. And I know the galaxies get rapidly refitted when war comes and they suddenly lose. or All these science things get removed and they get more shielding and more weapons and more everything. And they basically turn from a fleet cruiser into a fleet battleship almost or at least a battle cruiser but and that's with b uh, that's you know a battle cruiser is in the most powerful version of cruiser i.e. battle 
uh, space cruiser. But it was these ships, which to me, the little smaller ships, the, the light cruisers, which were always the vessels which really, and this is the Bozeman, really set a Starfleet apart and gave them the ships that were to fight their war. And in many ways, I always thought this was rather sensible with Starfleet, because to me, the Klingon, and to an extent the Romulan obsession with building larger and larger ships for war fighting, that's great, but that means you can only ever build so many. And when it comes to war fighting, day-to-day -day duties, you need a lot of ships. And that's where you need the smaller vessels. And yes, the Klingons have the bird of prey, but honestly, that sort of fit, that, that's one of those uh, ships which is, on a good day, can cause a lot of damage to any ship bigger than it. Because it's kind of like a tor it's kind of like a destroyer, a torpedo boat destroyer, a torpedo destroyer in the 1920s, 1930s, or, or even World War One. It's got this powerful weapon. It's got this very powerful disruptors, and if they can hit you, they can cause a lot of damage. But it's if they can hit you, and that's the point. Mm hmm. Whereas the Starfleet's light cruisers, well, my one in the Star Trek game, I, 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 commanders, uh, Admiral, a uh, Starfleet command, I think what's called, and well, I had missiles, I had photon torpedoes, I had fairly decent phaser arrays. I had a good general purpose little ship. If I wanted to ambush you in, a, in an asteroid belt, I could ambush you, cloak, field, cloak or not. I could hide and maneuver around that asteroid fast and you could do anything. In fact, you couldn't do diddly squat when I came around fast. And that was the point. I'm sorry, um, Jeremy Clarkson, if I use the name of your farm incorrectly. Uh, th that, that was the point of that little cruiser. And it was the one which you could, which Starfleet could always churn out in numbers. And then people point to the Defiance, and I go, well, the trouble is, in many ways, the Defiance is a correction because you have voyagers which are, I would go, looking for a town class cruiser level. They are a light cruiser, but they've gone for the biggest version of a light cruiser they can build. That's what the Intrepid class are. They've got the Galaxies, these big, large cruisers above them. And if you think about it, in that period, they're not really building the lower level. So that's made a space. There's no longer that mid-level light cruiser really coming into service. And that's where the Defiant comes in. And honestly, you could take a Defiant design and expand it slightly a bit, uh, slightly, not much, but just slightly, and you would have a very decent light cruiser. As it is, she's an attack, as it is, she's a destroyer. She is again. This is that. This is my theory going through. But and, and if I was going to put the defiant in any category, you might go, yeah, she's got trans. Uh, she's got um, quantum torpedoes and these things that gives her a lot of firepower. Yes, but she's a destroyer. Think about it. Think about her weapons fit. Think about her crew size. Think about her orientation. She's not a long range mission ship. She's not a she can do them, but it's not exactly comfortable. She's not something which is built with an overabundance of capabilities and facilities which you would have on a cruiser. She is a pure and pure warship. She's a destroyer. And actually a more realistic destroyer than destroyers which Star Trek normally has, which tend to be just small ships. Strange how Starfleet apparently never going to use his Reliance phaser cannons. See, that's the problem. I think that those were actually quite good. Mishlites, we do not mention Discovery in our house. We don't mention Discovery in our house since they made the decision about not transmitting it in the UK because they decided not to take it off Netflix. It's a dark, dark thing to discuss about. Very good. Of course you like DS9. You're a man of obvious taste. Mm.
I liked the fact about what I liked about DS9 was that in the previous Star Treks, you always had to, they were always going from place to place in an episode, and they're basically turning up and fixing all the problems. They're not living there dealing with the day to day issues. And DS9 showed what the day to day issues were like in the universe. And they did far more universe building. If you look at DS9, it does far more universe building than any other of the Star Treks because they're all focused in on the crew of the ship, whereas DS9 is focused in on the universe. And you actually get scenes, whole scenes and whole scenes and whole episodes which are struck which are not focused on the crew, but are focused on maybe, maybe have one or two members of the crew as part of it, but they're focused on people who are have nothing to do with the crew. But you need to know about it, because you need to know about what's going on in the wider landscape to understand what's going on in DS9. Star Trek was not good at fighter type stuff. No, they weren't. But there again, their fighters were terrible. And if you consider it took till Discovery for them to start getting the idea of uncrewed aircraft, uncrewed sort of distributed shit, distributed um, systems into there. And you sit there and go, well, but they have those in World War II. Why does it? Tell, why don't you have them in the original of the Gene Roddenberry series? Let alone why don't you have them in? Yeah, I can imagine uh, the original Enterprise. I can see not having them, but why they don't have them by next generation? Why uh, they're going? We have probes. Well, yes, if you have probes that do all the stuff that probes do, why don't you have fighters? Why don't you have something expendable that you can get out of your uh, thing that can act as a defensive? Because again, that would have been, and this might be just me, but if I was trying to deal with something like a cloaked, a cloaked ship, if I could deploy um, a squadron or so of uncrewed, uh, uncrewed small, small vessels from my ship in, uh, and have them operating around maybe remotely and maybe gathering information, that makes it far more easier for me to detect a cloak ship. And, you know, when we consider Commander Data's very interesting technique of basically setting tripwires to spot the cloak fleet, imagine that if every one of those ships had had a dozen or two dozen uncrewed vessels they could put up in the space around them. Now, you could say the reason they don't have them is because... They want to be able to go to warp at a moment's notice and they don't want to leave anything behind. That's a perfectly valid point. And if you're worried about intelligence and enemy gathering intelligence. But you would still, you would think you could design a system which you could replicate and construct that ultimately you didn't mind pressing the boom on before you, if you had to warp out of there. I.e. disposable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Frickin', I always liked the Ferengi ships. Hit hard and run away very, very quickly. Yeah. I was asking, yes, Galaxy Class Enterprise E was a hotel on warp nacelles, but Enterprise E's is a full blown warship. Enterprise E is post Borg. And that's when Starfleet goes, I'm not sure we need them. But then Discovery's gone into a new world and apparently these ships aren't they've forgotten that one. Starfleet has roughly around 30,000 ships or so. Yep. So much. So the finest sort of misrepresented. Bigger inside than looks in space. They got the scale wrong and stuck with it. Hmm. Very kin. Died. Defiant. Possibly a Dido? 
I'm going to go for a destroyer. You could say, like Dido, she's a um, cruiser built with a destroyer mentality. But mm, she's a destroyer. Um, yes and no on the scale. I think that I, I think actually does sort of fit the scale. So Scott, if you're not sleeping in the corridors, is it really a destroyer? They were sleeping in the corridors, I think, at some point. We never got to see the lower decks on the um, lower decks crew, the the the, the um, lower decks crew spaces on the Defiant. Uh, as lower decks, the program has shown us. And there is accommodation for the officers above who get their own space, and there is accommodation for the officers and the personnel who are below. Thanks, so, Dr. Slee. Can you please explain how brain ships work? Uh, if I managed to understand that, I would be. I wouldn't be a doctor of naval history. I'd be a god. Um. George Human, Galaxy Class equals Exploration Type. Intrepid Class equals Light Cruiser. Mm, sort of. Uh, more, as I said, Town Class rather than a Refuser Class Light Cruiser. And really what you need is a Leander Class Light Cruiser. You need something that's in between if you're, if you're Starfleet. If you're okay. Well, the fine had Maori level armor. I would, mm, I'd say a shanty level army, uh, armor. Maori, unfortunately, did get sunk in World War Two, and you have to remember that the defiant does get the defiant is not the defiant for the entire run, because there's a defiant. So she gets um, destroyed, and then another ship gets renamed defiant. Series in 90, that would have been too militaristic for Renamo. Probably. But it would be actually auto sensible for Starfleet. The very small ships didn't make sense in Napoleonic times either. MS Rogue gunboats as harbor defense. Fighters are planetary defense in Star Trek. Mm. Let me In the Starfleet Battles series of games, they had a couple of races that primarily used warp capable drones, uh, guided missiles as primary weapons. Hmm. Cool. Uh, Discovery is actually only a few years old on the 1701 in the timeline, but it looks like a hundred years later. Mm hmm. Thank you, Stafford, for being our lone admin today. Derek Phelps, if you've ever seen this, had a drone ship armed with lots of torpedoes. It's shown in Voyager. Hmm. Ah, yes. I think I do remember that. that yeah, again. But that's the Cardassians. Why don't Starfleet have that? Starfleet have probably, as we learn in Picard and Mary sometimes, are probably the most advanced computing-wise of any of the any of the races and any of the factions. And you'd expect them to have these sort of ships. They're also the most conscious about losing you. And this is one of the things, again, during the Dominion Wars, fighting the Borg, they spend half their time worrying about losses. Surely, uncrewed ships and small ships operating on the are a very simple way of maximizing numbers and reducing your losses of human personnel or crew or crude personnel or whatever your you know actual losing the losses of personnel dear Shannon, when the type 26 is replaced with type 23 what do you suppose will happen to type 23 so any potential buyers you can see for see they're fairly old by this point but you don't know someone might decide they want them Chili might buy one to get spare parts to keep their free running. MC Legend 13H. What if in World War II the Royal Navy got their hands on the Conqueror class battleship, World of Warships uh, Tier 10? 
just spamming. I'm imagining a battle of Denmark straight where Bismarck just gets HE spammed. Um, let's consider this. Let me see if I can find a picture. Now... Please note, I'm nicking this picture from Wargaming's official net, so if they're upset with me, sorry. Mm -hmm. So, the basic idea is, what happens if the Royal Navy manages to get lucky? and builds a sensible battleship like this beautiful, beautiful creature. And let's just remind ourselves, what does this beautiful creature have? This beautiful creature has a lot of guns. And I like that about her. But more importantly, she has 12 419 millimeter guns so 16 and a half inch i would have I, I would presume they'd be 420 but they have done it as 419 she can fire two salvos a minute from those so the question is if this ends up against bismarck and let's be honest if it does end up against bismarck then it's one of this with HMS Hood versus Bismarck. And let's see if I can find a suitable bit, another picture of Bismarck, which is suitable. Uh, what happens? Well, I haven't found a suitable photo of Bismarck, but I have found one of, of Turpit, so I'm sorry, I'm using that one. Broadly speaking, it's okay, because they're the same rough layout. Roughly the same layout. So, well, for starters, you'll notice this has 12 guns. That has 8 guns. You'll also notice that the Bismarck class rate of fire is, um, well, roughly the same. They can theoretically get off two two and a half rounds per minute, but that is a well trained crew with everything okay and mostly achieved by the defense guns at uh, on land, not the um guns which they were aiming uh, which they put on the ships. Mostly theirs is closer to two rounds per minute. So. But even if they do get two and a half rounds off from it, that means they have got a maximum of, well, let's say in any two minutes. Let's do it over two minutes. Two minutes, they fire 40 shells. In two minutes, this fires 48 shells. Because it fires four times, this fires five times. This is firing eight shells a time, this is firing 12. And that's if it's firing in peak condition, whereas this one is probably about right, because that's about right for most ships at the moment, that time. As a result, well, this has a maximum speed of 29.5 knots. Mm. Bismarck has a maximum speed of 30 knots, but let's be honest, that's probably not going to be enough to get it away in time. A half knot speed advantage is not going to get you away enough in time when you've got this thing raining down on you. So, yeah, you have 12 16 inch shells instead of 10 14 inch shells coming at each time. Each time, let's say they call the same hits, those hits are each going to be more powerful. Uh, Bismarck gets a lot of damage. I'm not sure whether she gets completely and utterly sunk, but I have a feeling that if 
the HMS Prince uh, the Conqueror class HMS Prince of Wales does as well as the Prince of Wales did in real life, then she probably gets to keep firing for a while longer. Maybe, maybe the uh, Bismarck doesn't get away and the Battle of Denmark Straits is where it ends. Which would be a curious scenario because if the Battle of Denmark Straits is where it ends, well, it would kind of give everyone a completion, but there'd still be the loss of Hood. And in many ways, the Hunt for the uh, hunt for the Bismarck and its eventual loss was cathartic for the nation after losing Hood. It gave them something to focus on and get over their grief. So actually, the loss of Hood might have done even more damage if she ha if Bismarck had ended up being sunk at the Battle of Denmark Strait. Does Stanflex come in equipped with integrated sensors? Uh, usually they have standard, they have sensors on the ships and they integrate into them. In winter, Starfleet battles also had fighters and some very cool ships. Mm, a few, but not many. Very good. The NX was just JJ doing this. Let's do everything but bigger. Don't count. Mm. Uh, we are the Borg. We took over your automated vessels. Do they, though? Because remember, the Borg do assimilate things, yes. But the thing is, if you have the same computer systems to control your own ships as control uh, you control your own ships, and your our ships have, are, let's be honest, any Federation ship, considering their size of crew, size of ship, and the complexity of what your systems you've got them running and systems you've got there, they've got to be significantly automated. They don't take over ships at long range because it's actually pretty difficult. It's a lot of computing power. It's far easier to just pummel the ship into, into submission. So I don't think that they probably would try and assimilate them, but they'd have to actually assimilate them to use them against you. And they probably end up building their own. And Frank's final. Drones can be taken over by transporting onto. Only if you have space for the drones to be transported into. Why are you designing a drone with space for somewhere, somewhere, uh, of the spot, somewhere to transport into? And you can set up fields which block transportation. But again, you wouldn't. You know, they, they just don't give them the space to transport anything into. Surgeon 90. They had to have rough in mind, so they were wrong, the Frangi's idea. Yeah. They could have just asked a humble Cardassian tailor for the solution. That would have been sensible. Given the wacky side of the Federation seem to be pl they have plenty of I'm surprised they didn't find a way to teleport a star inside the Borg ship. Mm -hmm. right, Has anyone considered the naval shell for use against ships of proximity views? Yes, they did consider it, but again, it's if you're blowing up outside of the hull... There's limited damage you can do. It's a good for what taking out systems like radar, etc. Once they're exposed, but there again, so is a normal HE shell. Which means, while the HE spam wouldn't uh, wouldn't have worked like it does in game, the Germans would have been very concerned by facing 12, 16 inch guns. Yeah. Nine six zero sixteen quick firing five point two five inch Mark One dual purpose naval guns as well. That would have been interesting. Interesting. You're going to handicapper with Hood. Hmm. What's that? Hello. Um. A twenty. Uh. Lost line of battle grade weapons and armor with a top speed slide and a line of battle grade ship's cruising speed. Used to protect ports in limited range. Death is a monitor, not a destroyer. Uh, the Defiant is quite fast. She's fast for her time. And mm, I would... Again, the, spe uh, the speed is equivalent to the size of ship. So I, I, I go with destroyer. And again, 
there is this old idea that the destroyers were always necessarily the faster ships in the fleet. It depends which fleet you're talking about, and it depends what focus they put on the engines versus other things. Destroyers are about having a big hit capable. Uh, there were plenty of designs of destroyers which were slower than battle cruisers, etc. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why the tribals were built as they were, because they needed faster destroyers to keep, uh, more modern fast destroyers to keep up with some of the uh, flag, uh, some of the um, capital ships coming in. Frickin, uh, on the question of Bismarck, if it hadn't been for the spontaneous disassembly of Atreus Hood and its fine problems, could Prince of Wales have taken on Bismarck one-on-one -on -one if Hood was on Prince of Yorgan? She probably could have done. And let's be honest, if the thing about the Prince of Wales is she becomes a bit of an unlucky ship. She's had, she's mobilized before she's ready. They they've got not got the turrets working. They've not got the guns working properly. Mm, yeah, she could have done, but it would have been interesting. Nice agreement. Does Hood still get sunk? I have no idea. That's kind of a lucky shot, as as Drac has got put for it. It would take Bismarck almost 60 hours to get out of range of that ship. I doubt they'd have 60 hours. So, okay, if Hood and Bismarck had sunk each other, how would that have been perceived? Well, the Germans would have sl would have um, basically framed it as David versus Goliath. Uh, the British would have been upset about losing Hood, but she would have been a hero and immediately expect a new battleship to be named HMS Hood. So Vanguard would probably be renamed Hood. Uh, and probably might not have been able to be um, scrapped as she was. And you probably have a few... Uh, well, let's put it this way. It would have borrowed the British it would have been a one for one loss. So it wouldn't have worried the British too much strategically. See much not a Bismarck Werberu, but uh one on one with Rodney. Uh, Rodney's gonna take a lot of bad hull hits, observably tool free world. On in the nicest way on what so don't tell me, in your one-on-one, -on -one, the, they're sailing along like, nice each other like that. Because Rodney's not going to do that in a one-on-one. -on -one. Rodney's going to manoeuvre around, for starters, like she does, uh, when she's actually fighting Bismarck. And also, she's probably going to be fo uh, facing Bismarck like that for much of the time. Um, because their entire thing is going to be to try and keep her her her... her profile as narrow as possible to make it difficult for Bismarck hitter. So I can understand where, if you've got them sailing alongside each other like this, blasting away each other, you've got a chance. But um, again, also, don't take this the wrong way, but Freeboard has less or no effect on the terms of the actual hull hits. Um, you hit the hull, that's not good. But there again, the hull on the Rodney is pretty heavily armoured. That thing's going to take a lot of pounding before it's going to start giving in, uh, giving in too much to Bismarck. Nice agreement. Would HMS Century have made a good aircraft repair ship? How much money are you prepared to put in into making this? That's the question. Definitely, I'd say, uh, Doctor. Looking at my what's your favorite sci-fi universe? I like the forty k universe. <sighs> if I'm divine designing a sci-fi ship in my head, I'm usually mixing up things from Star Trek and Stargate. Because I'm usually combining those two. And honestly, probably Stargate is where I come in as more practical. Because I like the Stargate ships. I do. I 
I'm sorry, what, the, the client goes warp 9.5, that's fast enough. And that is fast enough. Hmm. Come on, if the Iron had that came out of the ship, would the Iron Bismarck even have gone out as uh, out as she did? That's a good question. Probably still would have done. After all, that's the purpose she's built for. Ah, oh, yes, Bichon, that's the joy of the epics of the show. Uh, no, sir, we wouldn't have been... Uh, the transport could have created a clone army, very fast given how it's portrayed in the show. No reason for the red shirts that remain dead. Just beam down more, more, uh, more, copy after copy. Hmm. We wouldn't have been able to afford her, so the Vanguard hood would have gone to break us as it would cost as much to preserve as Vanguard as it would have to keep her in reserve. I the thing is though a vanguard named Hood after Hood which done that with Bismarck. Uh that sort of how do I put this? There is the thing that things are only important once your grandfather remember uh, once they're important to your grandfather. The thing was Hood was important to people's grandparents after World War II. She would have been she was of that generation. That name would have mattered. So by the time you get to the 1950s, when they are getting rid of Vanguard, it would have you'd be talking about a ship which has been a, a name which has been important in Britain for nigh on 30 odd years, and mm, let's put it this way: I could see that getting preserved. Yeah, George, suddenly having buffering issues. Bailing out. We'll watch this again later. Take care, but George. Sir Thompson, Stargate and Battlestar Galactica crossover would have been amazing. Mm, that would have scared most people. Anna, well, after World War II, was the loss of Archinkam Akanak impacts the cost of war or loss of empire? Cost of the war. Rimpolis, how much bigger did the Atlantis have to be to make stability and protection? Well, I'd probably be adding about 15 20 percent. John Luke, can you give your opinion on the battle crew, uh, battleship? Uh, uh, carrier hybrids in sci-fi, Galactica, Daedalus, Andromeda, Ascendant. You have mentioned you have something to say on them in past videos. Um, I've talked about them a few times. Honestly, they make sense in space. They don't make sense on Earth. They make sense in space. Because in space, your every ship does have to be a carrier. In the nicest way. If you're turning up, if you've got one ship turning up and it hasn't got shuttles, it hasn't got fighters, it hasn't got all those things to go off, it's got to be a, a carrier to an extent. And it's also got to be a battleship because it's got to fight itself. It, there's no point in it turning up and then being entirely dependent on the fighters to do the fighting for it. That's our reason why, if we go back to the early design, the Venator class, when I was talking about them, I really like the Venators. Because they make sense. And that's why in here, I like the Battlestar Galactica. I like the Andromeda. The Andromeda Ascendant is one of the best ships in science fiction, as far as I'm concerned, because it makes the most sense. It can build its own missiles. It can build its own point defences and repair them. It can repair itself. That makes complete sense, because that's what you need for a warship that's operating out at that range. Battlestar Galactica. This is another of those uh, lovely hero books, like the Star Trek one I mentioned earlier. And it is gorgeous. It really is. And that's the Blackbird.
others of the ba uh, others of the battle stars. A slightly smaller one. And one of my favourite battle stars, the Valkyrie. I like the Valkyrie. I felt it made sense. But the blood uh, that starts off with it starts off almost in reverse of the other one. It has blood and chrome at the front, and then it gets into the television books, uh, the television uh, video, uh, television um, uh, television programs and their designs. Sorry, brain went there. They really did a good job of universe building. Um, Pegasus always looks a bit to me like it's basically someone's taken the Galactica and gone, I want more. I want more. Everything seems sort of excessive. You know, you look at those engines and you go, yeah, great. You have eight engines. And they're all in a perfect circle. So if I'm a strapping fighter, I can take out four of those in one run. If I've got a mate who's going on the underside, I can take out all eight. And I can probably hit I can probably hit at least five of those in one run, and he can probably hit the other five. But it does have launch tubes, it has all the things it needs to have, and I suppose if you consider the world they're talking about, it makes sense. But it's a very good book. It is a worthwhile read. Mm -hmm. Rodney heading in that direction means lower range sooner. The higher velocity guns start punching straight right through. Yeah. Yes and no, but they also need to target, right? They need to hit their targets, and it's a far to a more difficult target. So it's all a balance. Terrence, where in the UK would you put museum battleships if the ground fleet was preserved in its entirety? Well, you'd probably start off with Liverpool, some of the dockyards in Wales, Scotland... A uh, fair number in the me in the Medway, probably some in Portsmouth and Plymouth. Dev Squad, I'm not sure if your engineering knowledge goes this far on theoretical physics, but which sci-fi uh, fast and light travel technology is most realistic in your opinion? I'm actually thrilled about this one over the years. Warp is an idea which they are working on, but I'm not sure if it would work the way that warp works in Star Trek. Hyperdrive seems to be theoretically possible. Interesting enough, I always thought the fastest of the fast and light travels was definitely Stargate's wormhole drive. That's got to be the fastest. And interesting enough, that seems closest to what warp possibly could work like in real life. There's a debate on that one. It's realistically, it's interesting. Um, pragmatically, it's probably warp. 
if I'm look if I'm honest, looking at what's being developed. But I have a feeling it could be the hyperdrive of some kind of like that, a system like that. And yeah. Hmm. Nice ignorant. Would you stop the repair ship come capture from being built? Nah, it's fun to have a. Dear student, on the subject of ship names, I've always been surprised the RN never did an HMS Golden Hind. I'm not. And frankly, in RN terms, that name was just. Mm? Take care, Trent. All right, so, given the complexity of modern ships and limited building space, do you see reserve fleets expanding? I'd love to see them expanding, but I doubt it. I, 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 I doubt we'd get, be so lucky. It would be sensible, but I doubt we'd be so lucky. <laughs> Interesting that Star Trek is one of the few sci-fi shows where human ships are not blocking the sort of tone. Why do you think the show designers go for this? As the Wintership, but supposedly in ca some canon somewhere, they started at streamlining matters while in warp for some unstated reason. I wouldn't be surprised if streamlining matters to an extent in warp because that affects the shape of the warp bubble you have to project. If you're a huge block, you probably you have to do, you have to create a far bigger warp bubble. Which is one of the reasons why I liked it when they sort of produced the hyperspace net hyper warp network that uh, of the Borg because it made sense to their designs because you saw the spheres and went. Mm, Hmm, there are those. That makes sense, because that, if you are projecting a bubble, is probably the best shape. It's probably also one of the most difficult to insulate, etc., which is why you would go for something on the lines of um, what Star Trek, uh, what Starfleet ends up producing, and quite a lot of other ships produce, which is sort of longer but rounder. Um, but the whole point is with the Star uh, with the Borg cube, it's just it's a cube. It, hmm? But no, once you have the... Is it Tri-Warp or Transwarp? Transwarp network, isn't it? It's Transwarp network. Um, that makes more sense of that. Because it is the mo it is a very efficient space. And if you've got Transwarp network already set up, it that matters less, because you can more easily maintain that, uh, that bubble in that high speed. Mitchell, it's in a new <coughs> battle cycle like the Pegasus supposedly had the facilities to build its own Mark 7 Vipers. Uh... Ticker, to be honest, I can't see the Vanguard hood preserved because the UK was broke after World War II. You know? Oh, good lord. Okay, Knight 6831. I have been over this a few times. The UK is not as broke after World War II as mm, there is a tradition of saying. Again, it's kind of like after World War One. The UK makes a lot of choices, and some of those pay off and some of those don't. The reason the UK, if you look at UK government spending and UK funding, they are not necessarily broke. But what are they, it's not, in the case of what are they prioritizing their spending on? There's a very different, uh, there's a long difference, a large difference, and a long way between a nation being broke and a nation choosing not to spend money on something. And when it comes to naval history, they choose not to spend the money on something because they prefer to spend money on other things. But that doesn't mean Britain's broke. It's one of those joys of history. I have to deal with it a lot. People go, oh, well, after World War I, they're broke. After World War II, they're not. They're not. And also, there's an advantage, which people often forget about the debts which Britain has in America, etc. Because there's always this thing of, oh, yes, well, you know, if you, own, if you owe a debt to the bank, they own you. Well, that's true. If you own the ba owe the bank £100,000, they own you. If you owe them a hundred million pounds, it gets a bit more complicated because if you fail, go bankrupt, then they now have a big hole in their budget. 
if you owe the bank a hundred billion pounds you own them because if anything happens to you you might go down but you're taking them with you that is the reality of what you're talking about sometimes so yes britain being in debt is a bad thing and they are financially they're having to pay to rebuild the country after all the bombing raids they're trying to bring forward new energy they're trying in new industry new technology they're trying to push all that forward they are trying to make sure the fleet has the best quality ships it does have in it so they want to get rid of the old ships they don't want to maintain them and they want to demobilize as quickly as possible so they can get the people back they are starting decolonization mm, they're taking their sweet time about it but they're starting it but they've been planning to get into that sort of in this period during the first uh, before world war ii actually and they've been doing um, going for starting the process of decolonization in mm, probably about the 1920s if not earlier you can uh, you can argue so all these things are factors and they make judgment calls and the thing is there is no one who's going to fight for mate saving vanguard because her name isn't hasn't been around for long enough Whereas, again, if you go back to it, the Hood name would have been around for long enough. Also, because uh, she would be seen as this symbol of this great battle, uh, it would be more difficult to get rid of her. So she probably survived longer in the reserve fleet. And that be how she would be survived, because the longer she survives in the reserve fleet, the more likely she's maintained. No problem, the Valkyries are soft on the belly. Yep. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's what If the USN never built any repair ships, should they be named as a Vestral class? I think they already have repair ships in service from memory. Um, McLean McLean 13H. Hello. 12 ships per class are good escort ships. But nowadays, only one class of ship has anywhere close to that number. The, ty the 13 Type 23s. Type 45s only have six, and that that it's now only eight Type 26s, five Type 31s, and five Type 32s. Well, we don't know how many Type 32s are going to be built. Uh, and they haven't announced that. They've announced there's going to be the 32s are going to follow on from the 31s, and I wouldn't be surprised if you end up with seven of those because they're supposed to replace the mine sweepers and if you the, the mine hunters and those sort of roles. And if you look at the number of roles, it's probably going to about seven ships at least. Oh, good. Rationing doesn't end till 1954. 916-683-631. That doesn't mean the country's broke. That means rationing has been kept going on, and that is a different, whole different policy. Just saw interior photos of Le Trompe and SSBN on Twitter. Look really enterprise-D. Hmm. American. We started off with a couple of museum ships in Walsey Docks, but then they got scotched. Hmm. I haven't. Uh, so can't go with No, I haven't read more Warp Marine series yet. I have heard about it before. That's what I was saying. Asgard hyperdrive are just OP intergalactic travel in a matter of hours. Hmm. Oh, Knight 6831. No, actually, it's not. Um, you have to remember one of the reasons why they keep. <sighs> okay. So, one of the reasons why they're keeping rationing on the books is because they're trying to reduce the outflow of, fin outflow of money from the economy. Okay. So, they're trying to get more into uh, keep the money internal rather than importing stuff. Because, again, a lot of the stuff which is rationed is the imported goods and the imported foods. And so it's all to do with 
to an extent balance of payments, but also to an extent trying to stabilize the pound because there was very real fears at certain points of the British economic scenario. And they were also trying to avoid, and they were trying to not make sure they weren't as dependent on, on the dollar as they might have been worried about. But there's all sorts of uh, very, very things, things going on. Also, another reason they kept rationing, and this is going to sound really weird, is that whilst, yes, it affected people who were used to having enough money to buy whatever they wanted, meaning they actually maybe got less, it actually boosted the food supply for a lot of people who were lower down the economic scale. So it was found as a good way of improving national pop uh, the population's health as a whole. So rationing is actually a far more complicated than just an economic reasoning. Okay. Okay, would a gun-based cruiser with just a lot of uh, with just lots of VLS cells be effective in modern long war? Potentially. Nice experiment. Could Britain's finances post World War II have been handled better? Mm, probably. The Labour Party and the Conservative Party both had ideas for various initiatives and they all made huge differences. But you have to remember the Conservative Party, and it was uh, this is one of the interesting things the NHS, etc. There is a report conducted under Churchill's government, and then the Labour Party comes and implements it. And there are three options put together. One of those is a system which is not too dissimilar to the Canadian system. One of those is a system not too dissimilar to the Australian system. And one of those is a system that uh, can uh, contingent to the modern NHS in the UK. And you can actually go from that report and go, well, all three of those systems are trialled out. And you can decide which ones worked out the best in your opinion. The reason the British went with the NHS was because uh, NHS model was because they were reconstructing so much from World War II, it seemed sensible. Whereas in Australia and in Canada, they were able to work with far more existing infrastructure, which was still in a sort of a, sta a stable state. Let's see. The UK is a democracy that often spends more of its money on not war material until the democracy spend more money on war material. Until a not democracy spends more on war material. Pretty much. Um... Nine six hundred three hundred. UK debt post World War Two was three point five billion, or three thousand five hundred million. Yeah, mm, doesn't that a lot of money? But Britain's to what the side? And going to say Britain could decide to pay that down slower or more quick, more quickly or more slowly. It's up to Britain to choose. You don't have to pay. As with World War One, the British government. Choose to pay, chooses how it pays down that debt and how quickly it pays down that debt. So, where one of the discussions which often comes through is could the British have afforded the, to build the G3s and the other battleships that they wanted to after World War II, uh, World War One? No, people go, no, they couldn't because they're paying this much on debt. Well, you have to pay the interest unless you want them expanding. But you don't have to pay off the balance at the same rate you decide to pay. You decide to pay it off unless you want to. So that's on the British government, and again, it's the British government which makes the decision post World War Two to pay down the balance at the rate it chooses to pay it down. I 
the front. War Spite was a name that had been around for a long time and had many battle honors on it. Was it hard to push for a scrapping? It was hard. Um, but the trouble is, War Spite was severely damaged, so she couldn't go into reserve. And she just fought. So, really, if War Spite had managed to put, had been okay in position, uh, okay, and been able to put in reserve for 10 years, she'd have survived. If Vanguard was named Hood, because Hood sacrificed herself fighting at the Battle of um, well, uh, at the battle with the Bismarck, uh, she would probably have survived till about the 1960s in reserve. And well, she's in commission till 1960. Anyway, that's how she she gets there till 1960, and she's scrapped in 1960. So. Let's say if if she's if she survives longer than that, I would say if she made it to 1965, she would have probably have survived. So let's say if she'd made it to the 1966 decision because she was called Hood and no one wanted to get rid of her, then she would probably have been turned into a into a ship in 1966, which is into a museum ship. Which, interestingly enough, Belfast has been a museum ship since 1971. So again, if Vanguard had made it to 1966, especially if she'd been called Hood, she would probably be a museum ship. And we probably have both Belfast and Van and the Hood Vanguard class, uh, Hood, Hood battleship. Jason, okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is a military history channel, not an economics one. Please, let's not try to litigate economic issues into this chat, especially using random context-free statistics. Ah, oh, fun times. I'm trying to answer the economics of that, but my own fault. I did touch the British Economic Historical Statistics book earlier. Whenever I touch that, it does turn into an economic session. Two hundred ninety. What rationing in the UK was to prevent inflation due to wartime demand being hurt during World War Two. It was to an extent, yes. Melissa Alex, how did rationing boost what people on the low end and the economic able were able to purchase? Because rationing, you got rationing books. You got an allowance of what you were allowed to have, and that was your book. And so it, it meant this is your ration, this is your allowance. So you go to the shop and you'd use your book to get it. You could use the uh, the, uh, the tokens from your book. So it it helped in terms of it lifted them up. Plus, it not only lifted their food, it lifted up their ability to purchase, but also there was far more employment. And far better employment and better wages actually during the wartime, which boosted people up even more. So it had helped people. Doxon, hello. I don't think I've seen you before, so hello, Doxon. I've always wondered with missiles, such a threat to modern warships, why do navies only equip their ships with two or three CRS? Why not deck them out with dozens, like World War II AA? Uh, similar reason as they only have single uh, single gun, single barrel guns, because someone's decided it would be too expensive. Hello, Sean Mac. Yay, Stafford, you have backup. And Dan, hello. So you have Stafford, you now have backup. <laughs> okay, very good. Okay, so we're going from the edge of our end from San Diego, but the argument had to do with colonials, which. Yeah. Vision, today's Vanguard's connection to Queen Elizabeth II would keep her of interest. The current monarch had an interesting history with the UK's last battleship. Yeah, that would have kept her around. And again, that she would have had that connection with the Hood if it had been renamed, as I said. Hmm. 
Pretty much, except the wealthy could afford to hire a farmer to raise a pig or cow for them. Just quite common, not only in the UK and US. Yes, but also there was Dig for Victory campaigns, and more people were encouraged to keep chickens, and they had all that stuff going on in their houses, and yeah, my family lived for all this. We lost three of my great uncles. Uh, fighting for the fleet air in World War Two, we I think somewhere in the region of it must be in the region of let's see in terms of every guy in the generation but my grandfather who had emphysema, so he couldn't go. He joined the Firewatch instead and was on all sorts of things doing that. Um, so that's about two dozen went off to war. Uh, in World War Two, in World War Two, most of my dad's side had fought in World War One, and a lot of my mom's side had as well. But most of my dad's side were World War One, so his father was too old, but he fought in the Home Guard in World War Two, uh, and did that. And lots of uh, my dad was just too young. He, I think he did do national. He did national service in Vulcan bombers. My dad did. Strange enough for a naval architect, but they basically went. You had engineering qualifications, and you're smart, so you're going to the nuclear fleet. I think he was a navigator, but I'm not 100 percent sure because he didn't really talk about Vulcan bombers much. He he loved to talk about ships, didn't talk about his son with Vulcan bombers. All right then. Next, Star Trek ship. Star Trek Shipyards to the Future. This is already, of course, out of date because of a new series of Discovery, which I can't watch because of... Mm -hmm. So, anyone talking about a new series of Discovery to me gets immediately the hard stare. I like these ships. I do like that this one has a full stuff about the USS Defiant in it. Which is pretty darn cool. I do like that she she does have her own little sort of shuttle bay. Which does make her useful, and she's rather cute. And then you have, of course, the Cheyenne class, which... Hello? Am I the only one who looks at this and thinks, Oh, good lord. What's you compensating for? But I do like them. Then there's the Springfield class, which are pretty darn cool. The Sadhiras being uh, capable of fulfilling a wide range of duties. <sighs> Challenger class. Oh, I don't know. Sometimes you have to wonder about the designers designing these ships. But you do get to go forward, and you get to look at some of the future ones. And they do have a size chart, which is pretty darn spectacular.
time ships always good to have in here and of course the relativity which they've said might actually be coming to a show at some point which would be quite cool it's good I was asking, how crew intensive are modern power plants compared to World War II machines? We're replacing power plants of World War II battleships, ours, to modern ones, help keep them in operational use or reserve. Uh, if you could do it, you could. Honestly, the density, the, the density of power generation and the crew requirements are dramatically less. But it'd be interesting doing the conversion. It wouldn't exactly be cheap or easy. So, Nakinir, how would the modern RN look like if Britain used the same proportion of budget for the RN as in the Napoleonic Wars? Uh, in Napoleonic Wars, it's usually... Well, let's see. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's go to defence spending. Sorry, I've gone to my usual backup site. UK public spending. Defence spending. And let's see. Can I go back to... When can I go back to... Oh, yeah, that one. UK defence spending since the Glorious Revolution. So, if I go to that one, and I add in that one. Mm -hmm. Pull this up. So, as you can see, as a percentage, in the Glorious Revolution and during about the 1800s, Britain is topping in at about 15% in terms of its spending on defence, which is GDP, which is roughly... Well, let's say it keeps to an average of actually... Let, let's go less. Let's go for about 10%, right? Current spending is about 2%. So you'd have five times the current budget you do for Navy. So... Uh, Especially as the Navy got roughly 40% of the spend, because the army always costs more, and they're including money spent on foreign armies, so let's say 40%. So the Royal Navy would be receiving some region of 4% of GDP, which would be twice the current defence budget and a, and a fair chunk more. Uh, yeah, you, you, you'd probably be doing the Royal Navy about three times the current size. Three or four times the current size. Certainly with aircraft carriers and all those things, it would probably have gone for catabar carriers because it would have a significant more, the, uh, more air group. But that's the reality of the scenario. If you have that more money, you probably go for the more expensive solutions because you can afford them. So you can afford the better, you, you can afford to do that, operate that sort of fleet and that sort of capability. Back in a second, someone just knocked on my door again. Hello, what do you need help with this one? It's called no again.
Not a doing. Sorry, there's a fox still keep knocking over that balloon pot. And unfortunately, it's a nice clear night. And unfortunately, the joy of a nice clear night is my mum can see it clearly on the cameras. So then she wants to think of text. So yeah, you probably have a roll maybe about four times the size it currently is. Because whilst you can go for five times the size and go, yes, 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 but they'd probably be building slightly bigger, slightly better ships. So they have more they'd have more powerful type 45s. They'd probably be closer to a type 85, if you know what I mean. It would be a general purpose ship, a far more powerful ship than the current one is. You that that's what happens. Hmm. Hmm. Oh. Then, a large number of anti-Nazi sailors hijacked the Bismarck in port and tried to affect it and cover Dunks. Can the RN save the Bismarck and what will they think they do with her? They save her. And they make a part of the fleet which is being used to um uh to patrol the home fleet area. But probably, and this is gonna sound strange, they don't fully trust her. So they would want to have a significant portion of trustworthy crew aboard her. Let's put it this way. They might even send her out to the Far East to keep her away from areas where she could cause trouble. Hmm. Christian, hi, what seagoing ships would you convert to a space pirate force? Three ships, Great War and earlier. Uh, I wouldn't convert any seagoing ships to a space pirate force. Honestly, the, there's... I, I, I know they do the space battleship Yamato, etc. on those things, and but that's lovely as an idea, but um no. No. If I was going to do if I'm gonna do a spaceship, I'm going to build a proper spaceship. Um maybe if I could take two uh, war spike duplicated and twist it on top uh, put one on top of each other. I don't know. Uh, you know, um, bottom to bottom. Version yes, this Protosaur is a cool ship for the uh, cool design for the ship. Yeah, true. Anyways, not a big fan of the uh, big fan of the uh, debris class from Wolf Three Five Nine. Ships and there's no one's a big fan of them. Hmm. I was asking, you can the USS Discovery from Star Trek Discovery is ugly. The remote model of the original from Enterprise is good there. Some other ship models in Star Trek Discovery are nice too. Hmm. Swindress, some of the Trek designs from TNG era were random models thrown together for one or two scenes. I think the chain class engine nacelles were literally just dressed up marker pens. That wouldn't surprise me. Vision, the board cue from T uh, the next generation was made of paper clips. Office supplies built a lot of ships in the TNG era. That again doesn't surprise me. That's what I ask you. Oh, like my great grandpa was in the underground. He was killed when a Vojtuk the uh, 
informed the Gestapo about strange activities in Mughal Forest. Dying in a shootout with German soldiers in Pomera. That's not fun. Did the defense spending uh, mission? Did that defense spending include officers buying their own fancy uniforms and commissions? Probably not. Senator, I asked for percentage of budget, not percentage of GDP. It's no, it's percentage of GDP is pretty much because pretty much the government tends to spend roughly the same amount of percentage of um, GDP each year. There was far less government spending in that period, though. Far, far less. That's everyone, but we'll be waiting for the US to get emails, uh, emails to work probably reliably. Possibly or possibly we'll be developing it ourselves for a while, let's be honest. Uh, no, I thought the Russian book contained permission to purchase stamps, and you still had to actually be able to pay for your permitted. UK stamps just provide what the book allows uh, with, uh, with pounds, uh, with, without dollars. Um, UK ration books are sort of, there are some which did and some which didn't. So there are some things you just could give the, uh, as I understand it from how it's been described to me by my family. And I haven't, I have to say, I haven't done a massive amount of research on this. I, I will hold it up. It's not an area of history I tend to do a massive amount of research, but chatting with my family is that, some things you could literally you had the tokens for and that was your allo allo allocation you ration book and you, you were allowed your portion from ration book and you had to give your tokens to the butcher to the etc and there are some things you're allowed as a ration but you have to buy uh, you'd have to buy them so there are some things rationed that you would buy and some things rationed that you didn't have to buy because they were your allotment your allotment national ration uh, your uh, national ration because the one of the things the British government didn't want doing is people, uh, people they were essential working in the industries and working things going hungry. Yeah, sure. Mate. What is your favorite seventy-four gun ship and line? Mm. Probably Thunderer, but I'm just going to check. She's an 84 gun by then, but I thought she was... Yeah. A, uh, the 1783 HMS Thunderer was a 74 gun third rate ship of the line, and um, yeah, she fought, fights at Trafalgar. She's probably my uh, my favourite of the third rates, and I actually have a design of her somewhere. I go and find it. Did you do it? Yep. Yeah. HMS Fundra. Here you go. Fundra. She's cool. Pretty. Mm hmm. Let's say da 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 da. Ah, uh, did you? That's got a very healthy contingent of Royal Marines on a Bismarck that swap sides. I was gonna suggest a half Polish crew, but okay, you can go for a contingent of Royal Marines.
Hi, Don Giovanni. Um, and Dr. Clark, on previous brew ships, you went off a bit on the went off a bit on the US light cruisers with five percent secondaries. In real life, it was uh, it was on supply it was on supplying the shells. The six inch were ineffective against air until the Worcester. Uh, okay, Don Giovanni. Uh, mounts five inch guns were the same secondaries on the US battleships and were the same caliber of destroyers. Prior to war, the light cruisers were compliant with World War uh, with Washington London naval treaties. They promised. Mm, they always promise. Yes, I know, but it's one of those things. If you have five inch and six inch, and if you have five, two sets of five inch or two different types, uh, it just see it's just something which I consider a pro a logistical and operational nightmare. They make it work. They do make it work, and I I will concede that, and I will get at it. But it's not how I would prefer to design it. But no, yeah. Not sure where you're going, Don Giovanni, but yes. Mission building new ships was very expensive. Never class borrowed from Galaxy class to save time and money. Yes, they did. They often bought moles from hobby shops to be destroyed in special effects scenes. Hmm. Actually, where does the whole UK was broke mentality come from? It mostly comes from people looking through the perception of the 60s and 70s and looking back. Because if you say the UK is broke by well, from World War II and is broke, then it means that the economic issues we're facing in the 60s and the 70s are not the fault of the governments which were involved. It's because of World War II. World War II becomes a good scapegoat for various things, decisions made by governments that, that happened in 20 years after it. So, vision. Star Trek is a post scarcity so, which is why, uh, why so much office supplies are available for Starship construction. <laughs> and a New Jersey Channel has a new video on the 18-inch loading guns on the US Sound. Doors and turrets, powder room, and shell room. Cool. I'm not shell, same the cans. <laughs> so, does your dog bite? No. Ouch. You said, does your dog, your dog did not bite. He is not my dog. <laughs> Mm, my dog doesn't bite unless your shoelaces, and then he lost one. But that's the uh, trainee assistant, Lucky Research Assistant. That's good. What about large contingent of Royal Marines recruited from the region of Polish forces in exile? That's just getting nasty and excessively cruel. That's right. And plus, they probably, if they're a scratch crew that's escaped from Germany and German exile, they're probably going to need extra sailors by then. Then, in which case, you're probably going to want the Poles because the Poles are probably going to have the better knowledge of German. So a half Polish, half German crew with some British Royal Marines tacked on is probably the sensible thing. And Dan Hermes pointed out there were all sorts of a lot of German exiles who not be likely to change that, e.g. Um, Jews able to read labels, etc. and working bits. More than likely they could be used as well. In fact, they honestly might get off the... This is going to sound strange. The people who brought uh, bring the uh, the Bismarck over, over might not get to provide the majority of the crew. Very quickly, they could be disseminated to other things. Oh, we need you to provide information here. We need you to talk here. need you to do this, 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 this. And you can move in expatriate German Jews, Polish, Royal Marines, and do it quite quickly. I can't help but think that every country is broke given their high national debt. Is that mindset flawed? 
Well, you see, here is the problem. It goes back to the analogy I gave earlier. And yes, to an extent, you're right. But also to an extent, if you owe the bank £100,000, they owe you. Own you. If you own, owe the bank £100 million, it's iffy either way. If you owe the bank £100 billion, well, they can't afford you to go bankrupt. So if you want to make sure the financial system is going to keep talking up your country and give you a good line of credit and support you when you're trying to invest and in building things and uh, underwrite your private finance projects, you want to, them to. You either want to be in a case where you owe them no, uh, virtually nothing as a government, which governments can't really run on because of the way taxation and various other works they need ongoing sort of lines of credit to an extent, and that's what their Bank of England etc. works on. Or you need them to. You need to be really in debt to them so that you own them because they can't afford to see you fail. No, no, Danny, right. All right. Hope you enjoyed it. Right. Um, I've got books to go through. So, Destroyers of World War II by M.G. Whitley. Now, I often talk about his cruiser book, but his destroyer book is just as good. Lovely pictures, lovely designs, all the stats in here. It's a really, really cool book and a really fun read. And I'm not saying that because of the fact it has HMS Janus on the front. Who looks rather fetching. Yes, she does. She does. So it appears that the chat wants to discuss the gold standard, the effects of leaving it had on global economics. Oh, I'm not getting into the gold standard. Not today. I would need a lot more iron brew and a few weeks of preparation before I wanted to get into the gold standard, where I'd be asking questions, answering questions about it. Every time I have that lecture, which I have to teach, which involves the gold standard, I'm almost cringing before I have to give it. But I give it. See which the government gives the national banks the permission to create new funds from nothing. They then load them to government. It's good to be the banker or king or both. Hmm. So again, if this crew of Bismarck side war, what would be its likely fate? Probably given to the Soviet Union. No, no, secret. Border of Bismarck. Over. What's this scenario? What happens to Bismarck that's being discussed? Basically, if Bismarck gets apparently this is a scenario based on what happens if a Bismarck if Bismarck gets taken over by um, dissidents who want to get away from Nazi Germany. Night six hundred three. A war is an easy scapegoat. Yes, because no one's going to really argue it was very very expensive. Darren Freeman, he also has a book on Battleship's book and a cruise book, and a chap called Chesnow did one on carriers. That he did. Jonathan Barr, do you have any of Mal Wright's books? Yes, I have a few of them. So, last book. Wings and Navy by Captain Eric Brown. And, well, how do I put this, the, the describer's book? This is one of the first books I read which gave me a truly accurate, I always felt, appreciation of the aircraft. Because it's the same person going through them all, 
And yes, he has the foibles of a human. He is human. But he describes them passionately, articulately, and they have great drawings, great designs. This, of course, is a Hellcat. Love me a Hellcat. Cockpit. And it's the last plane in the book. It's a gorgeous aircraft. Comes after the uh, Firebrand. From memory. Yeah. Also has all the details here. And this, of course, is Captain Eric Winkle Brown's book. Now, this is an original ver version, I think. And there is a more recent version being published. Yeah, this is the 1980 version. I... How can I say it? The more recent version has come out, I think, since he's died. The but this version was of course produced entirely by him, and I, I rather like it because the new one has more graphic, has mm, fancier graphics, but this seems more him. But they're both pretty much the same on the inside. And I like it because he has wry humour going on there. Admirable amiability, reliability, and sturdiness. These were, by general consensus of its pilots, the primary virtues of the Ferry Albacore's free seat, shipboard, dive, and torpedo bomber reconnaissance biplane. Valuable, valuable attributes indeed, but hardly sufficient in themselves to result in an outstanding combat airplane. In retrospect, the Albacore epitomized the ascendancy of the conventionalists over the visionaries. The least adventurous approach that could possibly have been made to solving the problem of replacing the venerable and patently obsolescent swordfish. That the authorities should have opted to perpetuate the biplane configuration at a time when the imminence of its final demise in all operational roles was surely obvious to all its uh, all is difficult to comprehend today, 40 years on. Particularly so when it's recalled that at the same time, at the time the definitive specification was being framed that was to give the Abercorp berth, the US Navy was already preparing to introduce into service its first shipboard monoplane torpedo bombers. Not that Ferry had failed to proffer a monoplane proposal intended to fulfill the Navy's requirements, but in their wisdom, the authorities decided that for the task required for the new air of the new aircraft, the monoplane was still very much an unknown quantity. Thus, Ferry had gone about what can be only considered as the overdevelopment of an anachronistic formula. Admittedly, the design team made as many concessions to modernity as could usefully be incorporated in aircraft whose basic configuration was already passe while still on the drawing board. There is no denying that the Albacore did offer some advances over the aircraft that it was intended to succeed, notably in terms of crew comfort. But the result was inevitably an unspectacular aircraft and one lacking some of the quanti quality qualities responsible for the success of its predecessor. Indeed, the inferior maneuverability of the Albacore and its less responsive controls, coupled with substantially larger dimensions affording the opposition an easy target, were to result in the swordfish outliving its intended successor, whose career from inception to demise was to prove most noteworthy for its brevity. He's cool. Mm-hmm. That's good. My, uh, no secret. It seems both you and Sir Thompson were right in part. All ration items had to be paid for. Home, however, price controls were in place. Beyond this, subsidies for the poor to recover cost. Hmm. Then room. Admiral Luchens was fairly anti-Nancy. I come to suspect the chat while on uh, the chat while on of Runberg was a cover to keep his family from being target. Mm. Not sure.
I promise you, the Garth Space Captain was not a fan of Spalding. No, he wasn't. That's we're definitely sure of. Lucian's, I'm less so sure of. My second one, how long would a Royal Navy fleet of five Type 62 anti-air warfare frigates, 23 Type 15 class ASW frigates, and 10 Type 16 class ASW frigates last? Doing what? Just being in service? Probably about 20, 30 years. Uh, sorry, it's a night scary one. You, do, do, you have to get decide more. Are they in a combat operation, or are they just doing normal duty patrols? Then probably, as I said, 20, 25 years. That's, you know, once you get the ships, you don't get rid of them that quickly. Sorry, sarcasm coming through a little bit, but yeah. So, Admiral Canaris kept leaking to the Allies everything and kept being ignored. Why? What makes you think he was ignored? You're you're thinking something. Uh, you're going through in your um. You're forgetting one thing. He might not be ignored, but would he be fully trusted? Would you fully trust the head of the intel enemy intelligence service sending sending information? Would you if would you fully trust it automatically? You are acknowledging that he is a wily old fox and a, a very proficient spy master. Would you really be doing your job as the head of Allied Intelligence if you trusted everything Canaris told you? No, you wouldn't be. So, the information factors in. We don't know what information he gave them. We have no records of that. We don't know how it was acted on or how it wasn't acted on. Again, people often go, oh, well, Denmark Straits. Well, Denmark Straits, on paper, you've rushed out HMS Hood and Prince of Wales. You've got a brand new battleship, which has got latest armor and latest guns and latest fire control. And you've got one of your most worked up, capable veteran units. That, on paper, is a significant force to take on what is a battleship, a battleship and a cruiser. You've got a battleship and a battle cruiser. On paper, that is a fairly even, if not a fairly even, in fact, advantage British fight. Who started the holy war now? Stafford, we were going to get the Blackburn Blackman mentioned the moment Dan joined, uh, Dan, or as he calls himself, the Archbishop of the Blackburn Blackburn, joined the chat. Hmm. Um, in Australia, I'm not sure Admiral Canaris leaked to such. Certainly declared it would decide it would be better if some information he had come by. Fail to get passed on. Mm -hmm. My ticker, those were conversions of World War II emergency destroyers. Well, they did stay in service for roughly, well, oh, memory. Uh, type 62. Mm hmm. Hmm. Ah, oh, that's the proposed high speed air direction, uh, air direction, aircraft direction frigate. 62. 
Well, they weren't. They weren't actually built. But if they had been built, they'd probably spend in service about twenty years, which is what most of the rest seem to end up in service. Most of them tend to sort of go away by about the nineteen sixties. Hmm. It's actually a really cool graphic down on the type system of the Royal Navy on the wiki page. But yeah. Um, do -do 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 -do. Sometimes, but no, they did probably about twenty years. They were probably being service and built from the nineteen sixties. Do you think that as one web satellite internet is owned by the UK government, it'll be linked with Skynet? And if so, how worried about the rest of the world would be, uh, should the rest of the world be? Oh, good lord! Well, then I presume if one web gets linked with Skynet, then that becomes the one. The I don't know the sky, one Sky Webnet. Or the one web Skynet. Or the Sky's One Net. Or the one true Skynet. I'm not sure. Uh, it, 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 there's lots of options of what it could become. Oh, look, I always thought the cockpit, I would cause a swordfish would enclose the cockpit. It's slightly more different than that. It's bigger and they did some work. They did actually do some work. Hmm. Yeah, they're worn out, but they're not that worn out. And remember, as part of the rebuild, they are upgraded and their engines are fixed and there are songs. It costs money, but it it's slightly less than building a new one, is what they decided. Plus, you're taking a destroyer and razzing it down to a frigate roll. And sorry, if anyone just watched that, I think I just absentmindedly, after watching on the camera, ate my scab <laughs> on my ear, because I cut my ear. And I flicked it, a, a bit came off in my finger, and I think I ate it rather than flicking off. I'm sorry. <sighs> I haven't done that since I was a kid. Mm-hmm. MC, MC Legend 38, what name would you give a modern Royal Navy cruiser class? Wait till the Type 83 paper comes out from me and Drac. You'll see it. Mm hmm.
I think we never would have known if you hadn't told us. Well, yes, but I I remember someone once saying I was picking my ear or something, and it was they was disgusted. So, apologies. <sighs> apologies. I, I I don't know why I did it. I just suddenly saw it on the screen. Went, what the frick are you doing, Alex? I went, oh, oops. I apologize for that one. What you did, what you read about the albacore would, um, what you, uh, come, what you just read out about the albacore would fit about the, with all the B fifty two supposed accessory aircraft. Well, that it would, that it really would. It really, really would. Sadly enough. <clears throat> All right then. Oh. So I'm going to answer questions until I run out of iron brew. Let's see how much. Of the brew I have left. Because there we go, there's a glass. Make sure I grab the right bottle, otherwise, you will get a lot of hope. I have this much brew left. So, questions till I run out of iron brew. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Actually, I've, I've heard people say the UK is in the same place that they were after World War II, but as you said a while back, they'd spend their way out of it. And we're not in the same place where we were after World War II, by a long way. For starters, no one's blown up half our infrastructure. <laughs> kind of helps, that, in the scenario. Look, people get obsessed with the World War II analogies. Be very, very careful when someone starts making a World War II analogy, or World War I. They're often doing it because they don't want to make a point and they don't want to be discrutinized because they want to hide behind national imagery and joy. And it often doesn't make sense when you actually boil down to the facts. Be very, very careful any one time it talks about World War II. It's like at the moment with current immigration crisis that we're supposedly having, which we sort of are having, in that the amount of issues, and it depends whether you uh, whether you argued for or against Brexit, your position, your toy taking on it, all these things, uh, and you know all those things. Uh, there are all sorts of issues about it, but the point is, both sides are using their perspective on the facts to skew it in their favour. And one of the interesting things I've seen is a lot of people blowing up a recent, a recent poll, which was basically, oh yes, a lot of Tory voters are very annoyed about the immigration, cri the immigration crisis on the South Coast. They are. This means the government must act. The government are acting. Do the go is the government, if the government's truly sensible though, are they worried those Tory voters will vote for anyone else? No. Why? Why are they not worried about those Conservative voters who are voting for anyone else? Because those voters will know that if, A, if they do decide their votes on based on immigration policy, they're going to have less faith in the Conser in the Labour Party doing anything about it than the Conservatives. 
because the Labour Party here have always been traditionally far more pro-immigration and, pro and tend to be far more nicer about these things. So that's a real issue. That, that's sort of case of issue of if the Labour Party tries to move to the right of the Conservatives, they're going to alienate their own base and activist support. And if the conser if the people who vote vote for, uh, people who are annoyed for it, Conservatives are annoyed for it, decide not to vote for the Tories because of it. Then, well, if they vote for UKIP, that's probably gonna that's votes away from the Tories, which means Labour more is more likely to get in, which means you get a Labour government. If they don't vote, that means the Labour government is more uh, then the Tories are not less likely to win, which means the Conser Labour government gets in. So their only option is to vote Tory, is to vote Conservative. It's one of the true scenarios in politics. In some of these scenarios are really are binary. The thing is, British politics isn't as binary as American politics is quite now, where if you are on the left, you only have one party to try to vote for, and if you're on the right, you only have one party to vote for. You, you, you don't, and the people in the middle are just going, which one do we vote for? There are certain issues in politics which are binary. And the trouble is, that means you can be as upset as you want with the party on your side because you perceive them as not doing the job the way you'd like them to do it. But you're not going to vote for anyone else because you know they're at least going to do the job as you see it. And it's the same when we start, when you go back to the, to the, the, the whole thing with World War II. The amount of times you'll see World War II analogy, I know people go, Britain standing alone, or, oh, look at all these pilots who were, weren't British who were fighting as part of the Battle of Britain. The same can be true, but also here's the thing. Every time I see that, I sit there and go, but it's always the British Empire that's fighting. Britain, even if it hadn't had all the European allies, would have still been Britain, Canada, Australia, and all the nations of the British Empire fighting alongside Britain and fighting as part of the empire fighting that war. The fact it then has European allies as well, who are the Free French, the Free Polish, all those other ones, is great. They are really critical and really useful and really helpful. But there is no scenario where Britain is alone. So whether you go for a, a European-centric Britain's not alone, you're wrong. And if you're going for a Britain's alone, again, European-centric, you're wrong. Britain is in no circumstance alone. That's the whole reason Britain has a global empire and one of the reasons why it's a problem for Germany to fight it. And also one of the reasons why people go, ah, yes, the German economy is bigger than the British economy, therefore they could win. You sit there and go, is it really? Because in the nicest way, the economy's overheating in Germany because they've been doing a rearmament program and they're having trouble paying for it. And that's one of the reasons why they have to invade countries to pay for it to rearm, whereas the British economy is warming up and starting to rearm. But... More importantly, they've got a whole lot of other economies. And you must remember, the Canadian, we have just as much debt in many ways to the Canadians as we do the Americans after World War II, because they keep writing us blank checks as well. Mm -hmm. Uh... Alfred B228, is the classification of cruiser going to the, to go by the wayside to, to be replaced by destroyer, or will maybe retain the classification? It's already gone by the wayside because of because of the cruiser's association with Empire. That's why destroyers are growing so big. Senator, so, are uh, uh, SimSec enabled new academic sources for modern naval warfare? Yep, they're pretty good. Hmm. That's clear. What would have replaced Unicorn's AA battery during a rebuild in 1954 if it had gone ahead? And how long would it take to complete? Ooh. Depends on how long it get takes to complete, depends on what's replaced it with. Probably gets a lot of 40 a lot of 40 millimeter. Maybe loses the four inch guns, maybe gets an early version of an early missile system. Yeah. 
Sav Nelson, that's a nice sounding craft, but if you're wanting to support OPVs, what are you supporting them for? Because if you've got OPVs going into the level of war zone where you need that amount of fire support, then why are your OPVs there in the first place? That's that's the question. If you've got a if you are having to send what is in effect a a small arsenal ship to provide supply support for your OPVs, you why are your OPVs anywhere near there? Because OPVs are not war fighting vessels; they're patrol vessels, they're presence vessels on maritime security missions. They're supposed to deal with terrorists and coast guard ships and trawlers, which are wayward. They are not supposed to deal with war fighting vessels. So if your OPV is in a scenario where it needs a war, uh, where it needs ba basically a warship to come and support it, you've something's gone seriously wrong, and probably having that is not going to help. That's the problem with it. I can see your logic, but the the, the point of your logic is that you've got to a scenario where you've got it that bad has gone wrong. That frame, why did we only get two of the audacious class carriers? Because of government cutting funding. Uh, Frank Swanner, have you seen the Lex TV show? No, I haven't actually. Sean Mac, who's. I uh, don't watch a lot of TV at the moment. Um, Sean Mac, whose fault was it that there wasn't a push for dual purpose guns on the Royal Navy destroyers? Um, BT and Chatfield were a problem, but remember there was a push. The 4.5 was the dual purpose, it was delayed in entry. Originally, the tribal class destroyers were supposed to be fit with, fitted out with um, four dual per, four four point fives, uh, four dual four point five, uh, four twin four point fives, but they didn't have them available. Then the four point seven was supposed to be a dual purpose mount that they had. It was the earlier dual purpose, and it turned out to be not good because it was a low angle AA, not high angle. So that was the reason it wasn't dual purpose. It wasn't really because the gun wasn't capable. It was because the mount that had been designed wasn't capable of supporting it. And then the 4.5 came available. So it's it's a complicated story. Uh. Do kinetic cannons in space a la Viper make sense given Newtonian physics, or do we accept the thrust advantage as given? Let's put it this way. It's a possible in theory one. I'd have to actually test in reality to be sure. Very hard. If in doubt, bang the jingo drum and hide behind wartime spirit myths. And then it diverts and folk talk about something else. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, bearing in mind what ha the drop that used to happen in Hurricanes, uh, Spitfires and um, Hunters were firing kind of... Uh, let's be honest, there is a difference in firing in space to firing in, in a um, planetary atmosphere. There is a difference. Like there's a difference with lasers. Ah, to pass. Then Stradling. UK alone also disregards the US situation. The USA could not afford losing Britain and the Atlantic, being to become the Germans' pond on which US trade could uh, sail on Germany terms. And well, that was never really going to happen unless you got some kind the Royal Navy and the German Navy were somehow combined together. And the Royal Navy would probably go down fighting to defend Britain, so that wasn't really a likely case. More a case of, have you considered the effort of America would have to go to to invade Ireland, then Britain? Because, nicest way, and I, I mean this with all good due respect to the people of Ireland, do you think Germany would have stopped with just invading Britain? They wouldn't have. If they managed to get Britain... That little, uh, the island would have been a next target. I know, you actually have two voting for choices. Vote for your party or stay home. And then the other side wins and they 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 might not do the things you like. If you're, I said, if you're in immigration, you don't like. Hmm. Some countries actually have three or four more political parties. They get along nonetheless. 
Yeah, it, mm, I have to say this part. Of me, I, I have. I, I don't like a proportion representation system in salt in whole. I would. I have often I have explained this before in other chats and other discussions that my idea, if I was going to reform the UK political system, would be the second. Uh, basically, the first chamber would be elected as it is. House of Commons first past the post would have roughly six hundred seats, and then elected second chamber would be four hundred seats. And what they would do is they would take the all the votes cast in the first uh, first election uh, would be added up. And they would work out the percentages. So each party, uh, for every quarter of a percent you get, you get a full seat. You get a seat. And instead of the parties being able to choose them, the people chosen for those seats would be get, get it in order of first loser, i.e., the people who got the most votes in the constituency they were running, but didn't win the seat. And the rule would be: you could only take that. You could only get run for election and fail. Three to, uh, two, you could only serve in that house two turns in a row. Uh, or two, uh, so basically, you could keep running, but you know you could only do two turns, and then you couldn't run. It, you couldn't do another turn. So, so you didn't keep losing and keep staying in the second house. And my view is that would make your votes all count. Everyone's everyone's votes matter, especially the idea that oh, my vote doesn't count in my area because it uh, there's a let's say this. That political party, the um, rocking rocking reindeer party, always wins in my area. They always have the majority vote. That wouldn't matter because if you still want to vote for the Elvis Elves, you can vote for the Elvis Elves, and your vote might not. You might not. They might not win, and you'll ever have a chance of winning in your seat. But your votes will add up across the country as a whole to them getting the presence in the second chamber, and I think that would provide both the stability strong government section which first past the post tends to doesn't always but tends to provide and the representation and would also stop a lot of the idea of my vote doesn't count and i you know all that that sort of uh, claims of disenfranchisement it would also allow this is going to sound strange a scenario where parties like the lib dems Etc. could and to an extent the Greens, I suppose, would actually get more of a presence in national government without getting a presence in national government, if that makes sense. Because the one of the things is some of the Greens I quite like some of their ideas on. Some of them are actually good ideas when you read their papers. However, I would not like the Greens to end up in government because I I, I find some of the, 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 the quite uh, there's a some of their ideas are quite good. Some of their ideas I'm less keen on, but that's my personal view. That is very much my personal view. And as I've mentioned before, I was a Conservative borough councillor, so mm -hmm. you can look me up. Uh, the reason I uh, always don't open minutes is I, I find people strange. On. You can I think you can actually find me on Wikipedia. Is that uh, my name of having been elected? And when I was elected and what how many votes I got. And the fact that I lost the next time. Because everyone decided to stay home in protests against the government against Theresa May. Oh, no. Alfred B. Twitter, Cruiser Associated with Empire. If anything, I would have thought a large first rate surface ship called a destroyer would be something up the idea of Empire thanks to Star Wars. Yeah, we're talking about the uh, the trouble is cruisers associated with empires in terms of the the actual Earth Imperial Age. So Thompson, uh, it's it's a lovely idea, but it's not to support your OPVs. It's not. It, it, it'll be a lovely extra ship, but honestly, then you go, well, could I use that money to build money for this to build an actual proper frigate? And that's the thing, because if you've got a run of four of these, that's going to cost you quite a lot. Whereas if you tack that money onto the run of, let's say, you're already building a dozen ca a dozen frigates, you can probably build three, three more frigates for that money. So which is more useful, four of those or three frigates? Probably three frigates. Uh, 
Um, MC Love Legend 13, would you make a video, whether it be on brew ships or a different one, video live on the Navy's World War II, if war started in 1949 rather than 1939 to 1945? If it came up as a patron, I certainly would. Uh, would I, as a patron choice, you certainly would. Would I do it just off my own back? Probably if I was going to do it, it'd be next year sometime. If I was. I, I, I'd have to think about that. It would take a lot of work to think it through. And some time doing some research. Night 6831. Would Shinano have made a good carrier aircraft repair ship with her? Well, she would have made a, a good ship. She would have been a useful ship, but the thing is, that's as long as you have aircraft and other things for her. If she managed to get built and ch uh, turned up in 1943, and let's say if Japan somehow doesn't go to war till 1943, then she's probably an excellent ship to have. But if she turns up when she does, there isn't much for her to be used for, really. Mm -hmm. Sure, Matt. Are six-inch guns on destroyers ever a good idea, or always building uh, sort of cruisers? Uh, six-inch guns are useful, but on a destroyer, not really. Not in the 1920s and 1930s and 40s. These days, a double six-inch on a cruiser, a destroyer, probably makes sense. Because, let's be honest, the size of them is they, they are cruisers, so a six-inch gun would fit. Mm -hmm. Just a heads up. Frank Swan, Duxy, if you pick up the entire UK and put it anywhere in the world, on land or sea, World War II or today, where would you put it and why? Well, if I could move it in World War II, I'd probably move it... Where would I move it to? Well, I'd want to keep it in the Gulf Stream. Uh, because that's good for our weather and good for growing things. But I'd probably pick up uh, the UK and, to an extent, uh, an island as well, because otherwise it'd be kind of weird them being set there and us being moved. And um, I'd probably... Hmm... Move it about five to ooh, probably probably move it about six hundred or so miles southwest, roughly. Um, roughly southwest. So put it more distant. Uh, put it sort of take it from where it's quite so northern as is, and put it further south. That'd be quite useful for weather, but the other option actually would be to move it slightly further out, and that would probably be more sensible from a security perspective of fighting Germany, etc. So just move it so that the English Channel's roughly, oh, let's say instead of it's mm, a few miles wide, move it to make the English Channel at least, I don't know, 100 miles wide at its narrowest point. Still able to be controlled from the UK, but uh, a little bit more of an issue. If you're going to have to do it and move it. So anyway, would you still like to be a counsellor or is that past you? I enjoyed being a counsellor from the perspective of helping people. I got to help a lot of people. Um, that was a fun thing of being a counsellor. People don't really realise what a local counsellor does. And honestly, they only tend to realise when you help them. 
and I managed to help a few people. There are a few people I didn't manage to help. There are some people who had planning issues, which I spent four years banging my head against the brick wall trying to sort out. There are some issues like the bridal paths. Um, we have these little paths which run through the borough, which I was quite protective of, and I managed to get some of the issues for them sorted out. But that took a lot of time. There were other issues which I wanted to fix. Things like speed humps and crossings, which I didn't manage to get done. I liked it from helping people, and that's why I stood again. I reckoned we'd lose. We had virtually no campaign team and all sorts of other things running against us at that point because basically the uh, Theresa May, which is often what is misunderstood about her from the big issue we had in the Conservatives, was that she managed to... <laughs> How do I put this politely? She managed to upset most of her activist teams. She, She's a very nice lady. But she managed to make choices which alienated her from the very people the Conservative Party needs to do its campaigning and delivery. Because the Conservative Party is more voluntary dependent than any other political party in the UK. Uh, that's one of the things that often the people don't realise about the Conservative Party. It is incredibly dependent upon volunteers. Uh, the Labour Party has an advantage in that because they're linking up, they don't just depend on their members to volunteer. They have wider organisations which will volunteer and come and help them. The Conservatives don't have that. So the Conservatives, de uh, Conservatives are completely dependent on voluntary support. The Lib Dems are similar, but because of the way the Lib Dems are structured and the fact they're to an extent smaller, they are less dependent than the Conservatives. But, yeah. It's a it's an interesting organisation, and we won't get into UKIP's. UKIP's a fun organisation. I've worked with them all. This is something else you have to remember. Because of the field I work in, um, defence and security and looking at those things, I have occasionally been asked to advise all of them, and I've always been happy to advise and work with any of them. I'm happy to... Uh, if, in the name of British security and British... National uh, British national interests and those things. If they call me up and wanted to, uh, and and needed my help or advice on something, or wanted my me to put an input on it, I would. And I quite a key, I always abided by you know not spreading around or not talking outside of home houses because you don't do that. Country comes first. Can we just remake the Empire? Um, well, that is certainly what the Wikipedia page seems to be suggesting we do. It does say you can help by expanding this list. Yeah, cruisers like the Tikos and Kirovs are still going, but that's for America and Russia. There are a few other cruisers as well. Let's be honest, the Type 055s for the Chinese are cruisers. And I would argue the Sejong the Greats of the Nor of the South Koreans are cruisers. This is a this is a thought that I have while watching the Rack's been on uh, Prince Crown of Plan Z. Had it gone through, and in your opinion, what would be a Lion class successor? It would all depend on the guns chosen for the Lion class. If they go with 16-inch, then probably they keep the 16-inch. Maybe something like the Conqueror from World of Warships. Although I wouldn't argue, uh, you know, that'd be an awesome note. Come on, uh, Rio PV support. If for some really obscure reason OPVs had to slug it out, um, put some martlet missiles onto the 30 millimeter mount and add a small rotor dome carrying more martlets. I think potentially, but honestly, I'd be more likely to go put on a 40 millimeter or add even a 57 millimeter. That'd be good. Honestly, the British 
if I was if I was upgrading the OPVs right now, the thing I'd put on with a fifty-seven millimeter, I'd just go that have that one of those forward and put in a phalanx C. I would like so. That's actually one place where I would like to see a phalanx on a on a OPV. That makes sense for them. Hmm. Uh, Royal Router, hello. Don't think I've seen you before. Uh, will the advent of railguns and lasers necessitate the use of nuclear reactors in service combatants, or do conventional propulsion systems supply enough power for those weapon systems? Currently, the problem is those uh, the systems of storage and energy generation don't match up, which is why the only real way you get railguns, etc., in service at the moment is nuclear power. But they don't want to do that. Alpha B228. Uh, how useful could something like an Atlanta class cruiser be if it had six modern five inch guns in the front and then replace the ones in the back with missiles? Uh, that would be pretty darn scary. Oh, look, uh, the tracker on these help with traffic. Five six of these local access roads were closed for no notice of road work yesterday. County council, I was a borough councillor. Okay, that's the level above me. That's Roadworks the County. In the UK, uh, Borough Council dealt with planning, um, housing, uh, bin collection, administration of council tax, uh, some of the provisions and supports and access for people with special needs and schooling. Um, and so we sometimes act as an advocate and a person who takes stuff to the MP and those sort of things. No one has a monopoly on being hypocritical. Destroying the future of the planet versus doing something like that does not really add up. But, mm, I'm not sure which one you're talking about. Uh, Dr. C. Uh, the first one, Dr. C. If the UK actually regained its old colonies again, but not by force, what would you call it? Instead of empire, colonies, Commonwealth. Be the Commonwealth of... Uh, well, it would be the Commonwealth of United Kingdom. Oh, Commonwealth of Kingdoms. American, I'm SDP, I'm SDC since the 80s, but I always vote for the MP and councillor that I believe is best for my own, uh, for both my own and my area's interests, unless they are pol uh, political thugs. That's what I tend to advise people to do, because honestly, they, it matters. Your local councillor especially. The amount of people who treat local council in the UK as an opinion poll on the national government, and you sit there and go, well, that's wrong, because... You want them to be good at their job, and you want them to commit to the local area. So vote for the person who's actually good. In my area, our local council tends to be residents' association. Rather than they're not Labour, they're not well. Officially, they're not Labour. Um, they're not Green or anything. They are the residents' association of Epsom and Yule, and they're a really interesting bit of history. They're some quite cool there are some people in there who are really quite nice and there are some people who let's put it this way i would not be sharing dinner with and they probably feel the same about me honestly um and that's the way it goes but i used to be i i found it quite fun of being a local councillor i have to say i found all the stuff quite fun because i had friend i've got friends from across the spectrum and I, I don't understand some of my colleagues in the conservative party um from the time there and some of my friends uh well not friends but some of my colleagues from work etc are often of the view that you can't be friends across the political divide and i go why not i i prefer to be friends with people who are of different politics because it's more interesting and you get to discuss these things and you can better understand your own perspective if you can actually defend it against someone who disagrees with you. Right. I'll ask questions because I'm finishing off the sign brew now and then I'm going to get to go to some dinner because I haven't had any lunch today.
I did promise my family this would be over in four hours. And I'm kind of being naughty on that one. The Type 83 plans are released now? No, they're not yet. <laughs> Come on, Cameron, if you want to run again, we could get you the ward with the Iron Brew Factory if you want. Oh, that'd be a dream. But no, I like my ward. I was um, counsellor for a ward called College Ward in Epsom and Yule. And that meant I had the Downs, the Epsom Downs, where there's the Derby as part of my ward. I got right down, and my ward went from right from countryside to the centre of the high, uh, to the high street, pretty much. Um, and I had all the issues to deal with. I had heritage buildings. I had a heritage area to look after, which was quite cool. I had parks to take care of and keep an eye on. I had playing fields and tennis courts, and I had all sorts of planning issues, but also I had a lot of people to take care of and all these bridle paths running through and traffic issues. And it was quite interesting, but it was also quite a lot of fun. I like helping people and I like working with people and I like trying to find a solution which fits the problem. And I'm kind of old fashioned as a conservative goes, and this probably is why I don't think I'd ever go much further than a councillor in the Conservative Party, because I don't believe you should make a decision based on ideology. I think you should look at the facts and go with the best solution which fits the facts in front of you. It doesn't matter whether that's an idea from the right, the left, or where it is. If it's the best solution to the problem, then that's the solution you should go with. You shouldn't go, oh, I must do this way, I must do that way. It's like, I get into a lot of trouble with people go who who are um pro who use the small government mantra and I go, Well, what do you want government not to do? And they sit there and they go through things. Uh, they usually go, Oh, this, that, and the other. And I say, Well, does government do those? What level of government does that? How are you dealing with this? It's one of the things is right. I would actually like a slightly bigger government in some respects because I would like more of defence to be part of the government and less privatised because of the issues of dealing with private finance and defence procurement and into defence operations, especially when you're dealing with tugboats, etc. I don't think... I, I, I think what you need is not a small government or big government. I think you need the right size of government. And the government you fight World War II with is very different from the government you normally govern with. And I think the trouble is when you go in with a fixed mindset of what you want, you make every solution fit, every uh, every problem fits that solution, and it doesn't. You've got to go in, you've got to look at each problem and evaluate it. Because, for example, if I was sitting there now currently dealing with the immigration issues in the channel, yes, I'd want to work with France and the European Union over it. I would discuss them that doesn't mean i'm pro uh, i want to rejoin the european union though because i don't think i think that's doesn't really work as a solution to that problem because in the nicest way it was going on before then um but i'd also be investing in cutters for the border force and i'd be investing in opvs for the royal navy does that mean i'd be getting rid of the type 26 on type of no because they're, uh, they're different things this is the trouble. So I'd actually be spending more money, so I'd probably be increasing government because I'd be buying those things. But if I'm a small government advocate, then I am uh, I should then I would that's terrible. I should be tr talking about giving that out to a private company or something for that. And I don't want that. You do not want a private company doing those sorts of things because they have very different rules of engagement, very different health and safety rules. And it, you even have different health and safety rules between the border force cutters, which are a civilian police agency and security agency, versus the Royal Navy. But I also don't want Royal Navy OPVs keep turning up with their guns pointing at these little migrant boats. But I would like a couple of them around as backup to the border force cutters. And you, it's one of those things. The first rule 
that you learn when you get if you get involved in politics is that if anyone starts shouting at you, it's an easy solution. They haven't actually bothered to do the research because there are very rarely days which are black and white in politics. There are very rarely days which are easy solutions and right and wrong. The rest of the time, it's nuance and shades of grey, and it's picking sometimes the best of the worst options, the better, the best of a whole set of bad options, and sometimes it's the least worst option, or sometimes you are actually able to go with the best option. But it's almost always a compromise. That's modern politics. And that's completely off topic. Oh, there's no dinner left for me. I, I know that one, Dan. Thank you for the idea, but no dinner left. Uh, first one, Doxy, how long do you think you will do YouTube for, Lightus? I like doing YouTube, so I'll probably keep it up. Honestly, if my my dream at the moment would be because I keep applying for lecturing posts and haven't managed to get a permanent lecturing post, would probably be to manage to make my income uh, more book YouTube and um, book YouTube and to an extent TV work dependent because that fits me because at the moment I, I I'd like to get the lecturing job. And I will hope to get the lecturing job, but I don't think I'd ever give up YouTube because YouTube and writing own books I see as the future of academia in terms of our research output. I see them as the way of me actually doing my work, me actually disseminating my research. Because it's going to sound strange. I can write a journal article, and I do, and it'll be read by maybe 200, 300 people. Brilliant. I can record a video in a few hours, and it will be watched by a few thousand. Now, yes, I won't go into the same depth necessarily in the video as I would in the journal article, but which has the bigger research impact? And also, alternatively, if I do the video, was that more likely to make you go and watch the uh, read the re uh, read the research article, which will get hopefully more people interested in the history? So I don't think I'd ever give up doing YouTube. Alfred B220, if World War III was to start right now, is it more likely the navies will run out of missiles first or ships? Missiles. Missiles. See, Windish, in the US, the newspapers have fired 90% of the local new reporters who used to cover every local council meeting. Now they do what they like, uh, like without most people doing it, realizing what they're doing. This is why I support open government and the idea of all council meetings should be videoed and live streamed. So people can watch them from home if they want to. Um, come on, will the, the Type 83 proposal hit the first build plant rating? Uh, class rating? Yep. That's a great. What would a new repair ship for the Royal Navy need? Take Adrian Sargus' bases and carry on. Hello, World War II uh, submarine history with Haiku. How about my pocket frigate for the border force? That might be necessary. Uh, Jericron, what would a privatized RN would look like? Uh, have you seen what H uh, what Qu uh, Queen Elizabeth I was deploying against the Armada? That's probably what a privatized RN would look like. Jomak, uh, what if you could give the border patrol carriers and call them cutters like the US do? No. Um. Yeah. Hurricane. Then, uh, then you get the RNLI having to deal with them. And RNLI volunteers really do deserve a drink. They are lovely people, and I always donate to that charity whenever I'm walking past them. Right then, thank you very much, everyone. I'm going to go get some food. Uh, take care. Have a nice evening. Enjoy yourselves. And this has gone on for really, really long. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, and take care. Take care, Albert Tusky. Take care, Seth Thompson. Thank you, 96831. Thank you, Sean Mack, Jero Cron, Calvin Gasberg, uh, Jess P, Melanie1640, 
Thank you, Steve Windish. Thank you, Albert Zaski. Thank you, Anuk. Thank you, DGV40. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Sean Mack and Stafford for doing an excellent job when you eventually turned up. So thank you to Stafford definitely for doing the admin job. Thank you, everyone. And thanks for everyone. I'm not a dick. Thank you, Dale of Close. Thank you, uh, Colin Cameron. Thank you, Derp Squad. Thank you, Jonathan Burrow. Thank you, Furry Kitten. Furry Kitten. And <laughs> thank you, everyone. Take care. MC Legend 13H, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Have a nice evening and hope you enjoyed yourself. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Dirksen. Thank you, Frank Spasado. Thank you, everyone. Take care.